Okay, this is going to be a Death Before Dishonor mega mix. So this this will be the intro here. Yeah, so very similar to the last summer, what we did with PWG for the All Star Weekend. Um, all of the Death Before Dishonor shows that I missed or that don't have a review up are going to be you know covered briefly here. I try to keep it as quick as possible. You know, some of them did drag on longer than I wanted to, especially 2021. Um, but hey, man, you know, Death Before Dishonor, um, is it the biggest show that ROH has had, you know, in their history? I, I think it's definitely arguable. It it's it's tough to say, like, what's, you know, ROH's biggest show. I mean, you, you could definitely argue that it's Final Battle, you know, but at the same time, I, I, you know, Final Battle is more conducive to Starcade in a lot of ways because of the timing of it, you know, the last show in, uh, of the year. Um, so I, I'm going to go with final battle. I, I just think that has the best legacy. Um, you know, w when you're talking about what's the WrestleMania of ROH shows, I think, you know, because Supercard of Honor is WrestleMania weekend, I think you'll say that. But uh, in a lot of ways, I think Death Before Dishonor is, you know, you could argue is they've had their finest moments at this um, this event over the years. I mean, you know, it's more of a summer show, so maybe you compare it to a SummerSlam. But, uh, but yeah, man, Death Before Dishonor, you've had, you know, so many great moments from, uh, you know, the start of the summer of punk, uh, you know, the, the, the amazing four-way. The best show I was ever at live will be the Death Before Dishonor 6, where Nigel actually retained over Seth Rollins uh, in the main event there, where Claudio turned heel on Brian Danielson. That, that's, that's such an amazing, underrated main event as well. Um, you know, and, and then obviously I think Death Before Dishonor 8, you know, a lot of people would say that was the, the, the best internet pay-per-view that they've ever done. You know, YouTube, you know, was probably more passionate about Death Before Dishonor 8, I, I think, than any other ROH show. And then, uh, you know, how could you forget about the Cage of Death with CZW? You know, a lot of people really love, you know, the ROH and CZW feud, uh, you know, a lot more than the actual uh, invasion in the WWE. So, yeah, Death Before Dishonor has got a, a tremendous legacy, you know, not to even mention, you know, Punk's, uh, you know, dog collar match against Raven at at the first show as well. So that that definitely stands out. But uh, but yeah, man, uh, this pretty much covers, you know, everything from the Death Before Dishonor where, you um, you know, Jim Cornette got, you know, was, was going to get fired from because of how bad that show was all the way up until, you know, last summer where you had Claudio and Pac at, uh, you know, the Tony Khan, uh, the last Tony Khan uh, death before dishonor. And then at the end of the video, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a remix of the top 30 updated list of the top 30 death before dishonor matches and there'll be time codes so you could just skip you know to whatever show you want to skip to and the time codes will be in the description as well as the uh you know the star ratings and all that stuff so i'll just end it right there i hope everybody enjoys the uh, video you know this could be once again this could be something cool to listen to if you're doing work on the computer uh you know moving doing chores around the house you know it, it'll definitely be good for that but uh yeah I, I tried to keep it as you know short and precise as as possible but uh but yeah and i'll end it right there i hope you guys enjoy the video okay here we go we're gonna start it off with death before dishonor 10 this took place in 2012 uh ironically uh subtitled the state of emergency which is which is hilarious looking back on i, I totally forgot that it uh it had that title attached to it because it, it definitely felt like an emergency call to fire uh, Jim Cornette, you know, Cornette actually got fired uh, after the show was over. So, you know, I, 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 I skipped this show. It didn't look very good. You know, you, you heard rumblings about how it was, it was a bad show and uh, ultimately it led to Jim, uh, you know, being fired. I, I think at Killer Instinct, uh, you know, one of the very next, uh, you know, Ring of Honor shows. And then they really turned it around with a very stellar glory by honor and then they they finished off the year with you know a, a pretty strong final battle 2012 but um you know th so this goes back to september 15th 2012 you know it, it's funny to think how long ago this was i mean me and kevin steam we were both still in our 20s at the time so this this was a long time ago uh chicago ridge illinois um you know, nauseating to sit through. I I I kind of sucked it up and uh, you know forced myself to sit through the show in one sitting. It was probably a bad idea. I, I got to say, guys, th th this is probably the the most depressing. Um, I, I don't know if it's the worst Ring of Honor show ever, but it, I could confidently say, you know, out of all the big shows, the Supercard of Honors, the Final Battles, Glory by Honors, Death Before Dishonors, Anniversary shows, out of all the big events, this has got to be. 
you know, the, the worst Ring of Honor show in history. You know, maybe there's a show that I'm forgetting about, maybe like Suffocation. I know Unscripted 3 got a lot of shit, but I don't think they were as bad as this. This was just really, you know, tough to get into. And, and when we're talking about, you know, you, you've heard the phrase in sports, especially in basketball, like, I'm a firm believer there are times where coaching does not matter in basketball. It, it's all predicated on the style of play. You know, and I'm going to use the phrase here that booking does matter in wrestling. And if, if you want to find proof that booking does matter, then you look to a show like this. Um, clearly, you know, Jim Cornette was just not a good fit for, uh, you know, Ring of Honor. You know, N Ring of Honor was never supposed to, uh, you know, appeal to guys like Jim Cornette. You know, this definitely felt like, you know, Smoky Mountain, Sinclair. This felt like OVW. It, it, it definitely had that feeling to it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say it was all booking, though. A lot of it had to do with talent. There, there are certain guys that should not have been wrestling on this show. I'm not going to say any names, but, you know, you could kind of figure out who they are. Um, so, so really, really quickly, I want to keep this short, you know, to start off this mega mix. Uh, Kevin Steen taking on Rhino, no disqualification match for the ROH world title. Um, you know, definitely the match of the night. I, I really wasn't that behind Steen at this time. I, I didn't think he looked motivated. I didn't think he looked great. I, you know, I, I never really got behind, you know, Scum and the whole Jim Cornette. Um, you know, storyline, it just, you know, f for my personal taste, you know, that it just wasn't a great fit for, you know, Ring of Honor, you know, for obvious reasons. But, you know, I, I got to give Rhino credit. Rhino still had some juice. You know, there's like a ton of gores. There's a ton of, uh, you know, F Sanks. You know, Kevin Steen used to use the F5 because he's from Quebec, you know, called the F Sank. Uh, you know, fast-paced match, lots of ref bumps, lots of interference, lots of chaos. You know, it, it wasn't bad. It, it, it was definitely the highlight of the night. You know, it was definitely a good title defense from Kevin Steen. You know, Rhino is is a big name. Uh, you know, Rhino and, and Carino. You know, Carino actually, uh, you know, helped Kevin Steen out. So you saw a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a confrontation between Carino and Rhino, which, you know, there was some ECW chance if, if you forgot. You know, I think, I think Carino and Rhino were like the last two ECW champions, and I think they were actually in the same stable. And I think when Rhino won the title, he betrayed Carino. I can't remember that far back. But, you know, the, the main event is definitely the high, highlight of the night. I, I thought the, you know, the tag title tournament was, was pretty awful. Really, really boring. Uh, you know, the finals were actually Scum, Jimmy Jacobs, and Carino uh, taking on Red Titus and, Ch and Charlie Haas. Shelton Benjamin was actually in Charlie's corner. Ultimately, he ends up screwing Red Titus and Scum because become the tag team champions uh the titles were actually vacant right before this tournament and um yeah you know if, if you're gonna do a, a tournament on a pay-per-view it's a mini tournament you know you had the two matches in the beginning the semifinals, and then they meet later on in the show if you're gonna do that you you really got to make sure you got the you know good tag teams in there you know tag teams that you want to see multiple times in one sitting you know th th this it just didn't go that well. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. Adam Cole actually defends the television championship against Mikey Mondo. You know, the, the match was good. You know, they 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 did some good things out there. It, it just it just took forever. It was a little bit boring. Um, you know, the fans actually got behind Mondo here, but you know, the style of match that they wrestled it, it was not necessarily you know an ROH style match it just it definitely felt like OVW definitely felt like more of a developmental feel and Cole was a little bit bland at the time and I was kind of surprised a lot of the fans got behind Mikey Mondo uh but Cole does go over you know you had some good things out there but for the most part it was just tedious to sit through um you know the the, the most disappointing match of the night was Jay Lethal and Homicide you know you would think two former ROH champions if this had happened in 05 or if this had happened in 07, it, it would have been amazing. But it just felt lethargic. It felt forced. You know, Cornette wanted to get Lethal to show some killer instinct. You know, the next show is going to be called Killer Instinct, where Lethal actually takes Cornette out. So, now, you know, not an awful storyline, but it just, you know, it, it just didn't flow, you know, the way I envisioned. The House of Truth match with Roderick and Elgin teaming up to take on the Irish Airborne uh, definitely looks a lot better on paper. You know, Roderick was uh, kind of doing the, you know, Rick Martell thing here with Elgin playing Tito Santana. Definitely took a page out of that book. So the match didn't really, you know, live up to his potential. So they're definitely building up Roderick and Elgin, dissension into House of Truth to set up the big Elgin uh, face turn. You know, they're getting him ready for the big title match with Kevin Steen. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly and ACH. This was actually ACH's 
you know, Ring of Honor debut. Uh, he looked impressive, but you could definitely feel it here. ACH got a little bit better. The execution on some of his moves, you know, just wasn't quite ready for prime time yet. O'Reilly goes over, but, you know, n not the sexy match that you would envision. Both guys definitely got better as time went on. I think O'Reilly was good at this time. It's just, you know, ACH a little bit too green. You know, this definitely had a, a little bit of potential. But for the most part, man, I, I thought the show was... You know, it, it was a drag, man. You know, these, um, you know, the first two matches of the night, Scum taking on Caprice and Cedric just had no heat. Uh, to Darius Thomas and, and Silas Young, probably the worst match on the show. Survival of the fitting qualifying match. It just, it was just bland as shit. I, I, I just couldn't get into it. The fans just didn't, you could just tell they just weren't connected to either guy. Um, yeah, just definitely not, um, a Ring of Honor show that I care to go back to. Um, it, it really is symbolic of, uh, you know, Jim Cornette, you know, finally, after all those years where, you know, Gabe is booking Cornette as a character and it worked out really well. But when the shoe is on the other foot, it was just a state of emergency, or, you know, a, a recipe for disaster. So, yeah, wasn't a big fan of it. You know, I know some people thought the main event was actually pretty good and it is good compared to the rest of the show. But it's, it's not necessarily something I, I will want to go back to. But uh, but yeah, that's glory. That's death before dishonor. Ten state of emergency. Okay, we're moving on to death before dishonor. Eleven. This is actually in 2013, September 20th, 2013. Uh, the the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the National Guard Armory. Uh, you know, very traditional building for a Ring of Honor. This is where Austin Aries historically defeated Samoa Joe. So a lot of history in this building. So th they actually do a tournament here. Uh, Jay Briscoe suffers a, a shoulder injury and Nigel is forced uh, to strip him of the title. Uh, Jay thinks it's bullshit. He said, yo, Nigel, when you were Ring of Honor champion, they, you know, you you were able to rehab a torn biceps and keep the ROH title. But hey, uh, Jay Briscoe has to uh, forfeit the title after the tournament. Uh, Adam Cole wins the tournament, and uh, that's how he turns heel. After Jay gives him the belt, he turns his back on Adam Cole, and Cole super kicks Jay. He uh, he super kicks Elgin, or does whatever to Elgin. I can't remember exactly what it was, and uh, this is how Adam Cole uh, turns heel uh, in Ring of Honor. I believe he actually you know turned heel and won the championship in PWG before ROH. So I, I think that's one of the things that hurt ROH too. I, I, it felt like PWG was a little bit quicker to the ball uh, at that particular time. But but hey, man, you know, Ring of Honor, you know, Survival of the Fittest, just from the reaction of those mixtapes, you, you could just tell it doesn't have a lot of buzz. It doesn't have a lot of historical value or importance. Um, but yeah, that is probably the tournament that Ring of Honor is most known for. I mean, some, some of them were hit or miss. You know, the first one was a classic. You know, some of them, you know, especially the ones from last decade are very forgettable. Um, but, but I'm trying to think, like, what, what's the most memorable tournament that Ring of Honor ever put on? I, I might have to say it's that race to the top tournament, you know, where you just got a whole bunch of just, you know, one on one matches, you know, Claudio and El Generico in the finals. I, I'd like to revisit that because, you know, if, if someone asked me what's the best tournament ROH ever did, I think it would be that one um, with, with Death Before Dishonored 2013. It's it's somewhat of a tournament. You had the semifinals. And then the finals on the pay-per-view, very similar to a King of the Ring pay-per-view format. So not the worst thing in the world. I, I, I think it could have been better, but I, I think it's a solid show. I think this is like a 7.5, 7.75, you know, a, a good but almost great show that's just missing just a little bit something. Um, so if anyone does remember, you know, um, the, the, let me just kind of break down the brackets here. You actually had Adam Cole and Lethal on television. Cole advances. You had Tommaso and uh, Michael Bennett. On, on on TV, uh, Tommaso advances to take on Adam Cole at, at Death Before Dishonor. Uh, Elgin, once again against Carl Anderson, you know, they had a really good match at Supercard of Honor. You get to see that rematch. Elgin advances to the to the pay-per-view. Uh, and then you had Roderick Strong and Kevin Steen, uh, a, a rematch from Manhattan Mayhem. Or, or Actually, I think that was at Manhattan Mayhem. I was actually there for that. Uh, and Steen advances uh, to take on Elgin. Uh, at the pay-per-view so that that's how it came off there all right so let's get down to the pay-per-view um yeah jay briscoe doesn't relinquish the title until after cole wins uh but you know you open up the show with jay briscoe kind of you know cutting a promo on nigel very respectfully 
It's not like Nigel and Jay were, you know, barking and yelling at each other. You know, Nigel was on commentary. Uh, you open up with Jay Lethal and Silas Young. You know, this was just a nice little treat to open up the show. You know, Silas is definitely in his prime here. This is when he was really tearing it up in the Midwest. And, you know, Lethal is on the verge of exploding. So a solid match. Really, you know, a, a, a cool little tone setter there. Really nothing to talk about. And then we get to the tournament. Uh, Adam Cole taking on Tommaso Ciampa, uh, the semifinals match. I thought this was really good, man. I, I thought it was good straight out the gates. Tommaso is giving Cole just some really stiff, you know, knee brace shots to the temple right by the guardrail. It just had a lot of uh, intensity to it, you know, very chaotic. Uh, Cole wrestled a very, very smart match, really going to work on Tommaso's knees. He's coming off of the ACL injury. So you saw Cole did the figure four around the ring post. And eventually, Tommaso just kind of passes out from a figure four uh, for the finish right there. And, and it's actually a pinfall while he's doing the figure four to him. So it was good, though. Th this is probably the match of the night. I, I thought it was really good. Next up, we have Michael Elgin and Kevin Steen. Uh, this is a forgotten trilogy. You know, they had that classic, you know, one of the best matches of 2012, uh, the main event of Toronto, right? Glory by Honor. Glory, I, I can't remember the number. I think it was Glory by Honor. In 2012, Jim Cornette's last night with the company, right? Uh, you know, that was their best match. Uh, so this is their worst, I, I would say. This is the second of the trilogy. The, the third one would be at Supercard of Honor. Yet, you know, Elgin and Steen, their matches were good. In this particular match right here, you could definitely feel it. Like, Steen was just, you know, in, in most cases, I would say Steen's weight. Him being kind of fat and having the beer belly and, you know, not being in great shape. It never really affected his matches. But if, if there's one match where I felt like it kind of affected it, it, it would be this one. He just looked a little bit slow. It, it looked like Elgin had a really difficult time, you know, moving Steen here. You know, just picking him up for the powerbomb. And, and, you know, the deadlift German looked pretty, you know, hard to do. It, it, like the, it, it looked like Elgin really had to struggle with Steen's weight. So you could argue one way or the other. Maybe it, it, looked, it looked a little tough, but at the same time, it, it was a tremendous feat of strength from Elgin here. I thought Elgin and Steen, I think it was pretty good. It, was, it, it felt a little bit long, but th this is a really good match. So Elgin goes over, and he meets Cole in the finals. Um, all right, after that, you had the American Wolves actually challenging for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships against the Forever Hooligans, Rocky Romero and Alex Kozlov. I, I, I'm pretty sure that Rocky, you know, wanted to name the team the Forever Hooligans. I, I think he's a big fan of the Sandlot, and the Sandlot has a, there's a part in the movie where you know, they're talking about the Beast, and the, 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 the dude with the glasses squints. He keeps on going like forever, forever, and I think Rocky was a big fan of that. Because you, you've seen him kind of mimic that from the movie. Uh, so Rocky and, and Kozlov, it, it was good. You know, there were Rocky Four chants here. They did the Russian National Anthem. At the beginning of the match had a lot of buzz. It, it just felt like something was quite missing, you know, towards the end of this thing to say, you know, this is a vintage Wolves, you know, classic tag match. It just It was just missing something from that 2009 American Wolves heyday. Uh, you know, Davey is really selling his core. You know, it, it, you know, Nigel's talking about, you know, he might have gotten a hernia. You never hear that before, but, you know, it, it, it kind of made me think of Kenny Omega. It's like, you know, w what causes these hernias? Is it these double stomps to the core? And uh, it just makes you, you know, think, you know, maybe maybe um, maybe these are quite dangerous to do anything involving, you know, the, the, these kicks to the, um, you know, the, the abdominal area. But, you know, the forever hooligans go over. Uh, I would say this is really good. It got 20 minutes. So it, it's just it just felt like something was missing to call this great. But definitely still one of the better things on the show. Adam Adam Page, Hangman Page goes over. Uh, R.D. Evans, uh, you can know this guy's Archibald Peck from Chikara uh, very shortly. Um so there we go with that. Roderick Strong actually goes over Ricky Marvin. This is a pro wrestling Noah uh, attraction match. Yeah, M Marvin was okay here. You know, he had a weird physique. He almost has like a m more of a uh, Takeshi Segura type of physique. Just very, very thick and bulky. Um, you know, Ricky Marvin, uh, you know, you definitely, you know, it's shades of Ricky Martin, shades of Lee Marvin. If you combine the two, it's Ricky Marvin. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't remember much about Ricky Marvin. I, I thought this was okay. It was more of a nice little showcase for, for Roderick. 
Um, but yeah, it's it, just not that memorable though. I, I gotta say, I, I totally forgot about this. So, you know, it is what it is right there. Next up, we have the eight man tag match. You have Maria at uh, commentary here. You have the hoopla hotties at ringside. So yeah, j just a nice little kind of break, uh, right before you get to the finals of the tournament right here. It, it kind of ended with homicide and, uh, Eddie Kingston just, you know, kind of crashing the party here, but it, it's an eight man tag match. You got adrenaline rush teaming up with, uh, Teaming up with uh, Caprice and Cedric of the uh, you know CNC Wrestle Factory, Caprice Coleman, Cedric Alexander, and they're taking on Red Dragon, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly. You know, teaming up with Matt Taven and Michael Bennett. You know, the, the match is a lot of fun. But uh, you know, Maria, um, Maria was probably the highlight of this match. It was just cool. You know, she looked great at the time, and you know, she really, you know, she she really is a bright girl. You know, she definitely said some you know intelligent things on commentary and. You know, it's funny, you know, her, her and Mike Bennett as a couple, it's almost funny how them as a couple, they tried to really, you know, become a powerful couple. They tried to solidify themselves like a, a, a reality television deal. They, they marketed themselves as Team Sexy. But hey, you know, Homicide and Eddie Kingston crashed the party. I, I, I never really care for that Homicide Kingston pairing. I, I just I thought it had potential. But, you know, ultimately, I think it fell a little bit flat. And then the finals, you had Adam Cole. Uh, defeating Michael Elgin to win uh, the Ring of Honor World Title. Yeah, I, I thought it was a good match, man. I, I thought it was great. You know, the, it definitely had a very, very um, dead crowd at first, but it really felt like they really, you know, woke the fans up. Cole just had, you know, Cole worked his ass off here. You know, th this is before Cole really turned heel. So, you know, a lot of people would definitely argue that he was a little bit bland at the time. He needed more character development. But this is what really solved the problem. You know, I think him turning heel, um, it, it opened the door up for Cole just to get to the next level. Because I would definitely agree here. There there really wasn't much behind Cole in terms of look, in terms of personality. But, uh, yeah, he really rocked the house here. Um, just the way he would hit the Panama Sunrise uh, on Elgin, which is like a straight jacket uh, German suplex. Uh, you know, Elgin was great here. You know, he, he, he looked like he was riding a bike just the way he was moving Cole compared to Steen, you know, because Cole was like at least 100 pounds lighter than Steen. So th this felt like Elgin was just, you know, uh, just going for a mild workout here. But the referee kind of fucked up. He got in the way of the Elgin bomb, and that's what kind of turned the tide for Cole. Cole wins clean. But when Jay comes out and tries to do the honorable thing and give him the championship, Cole just super kicks him and then he attacks Elgin. Uh, so Cole comes off like a, you know, arrogant, badass prick and uh, wins the Ring of Honor championship for the first time. So very historic moment. Cole would actually go on to win, what, the, the ROH title, I think, three times. But this is his first reign right here. And... Um, you know, it lasted until I think best in the world were that, you know, that's where Elgin finally won it from him. That was kind of uh, short lived, not that memorable. But hey, man, this is a nice little tournament here. It's a shame that Jay Briscoe got hurt. You know, you almost forget about that. Jay Briscoe, uh, you know, had to relinquish his first Ring of Honor world title. I, I, I think this kind of hurt. You know, uh, 2013 for ROH. Cause I think they definitely got off to a good start. I think they, they got a lot of momentum back at, at the end of 2012 with firing Cornette. You know, um, you know the, the championship victory when Jay beat Kevin Steen, that was very memorable. But uh, I think for Jay not to finish up this reign, you know, the proper way, I think he kind of hurt the company to a degree. The, this Cole stuff was a nice little change of pace, but... You know, I, I just remember, I, th I, th I think towards the end of 2013, I think ultimately 2013 ended up falling a little bit flat uh, for ROH standards. But hey, man, that's Death Before Dishonor 11, 2013, and we'll move on from there. Okay, we're moving on to Death Before Dishonor 12. This was the 2014 uh, Death Before Dishonor, and, and this was pretty cool. You know, th this... For this occasion, they kind of went back to tradition here. So if you remember in 2004, they did a double shot in Milwaukee and then they did one in Chicago. Uh, they did the exact thing here. Um, 
So I thought that was really, really interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, with this particular Death Before Dishonor, uh, never had a chance to see it. It wasn't a pay-per-view. Um, I, I do remember AJ Styles and, and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, you know, this, this was definitely the match of the weekend. You know, this was this was the match that I think really did steal the show. So AJ was able to make the show, uh, you know, coming off of the G1 Climax Tournament. So that was really cool. So the, the first night they're in Milwaukee, the attendance is actually 600. Uh, the, the very next night they're in Chicago, you know, Chicago Ridge, home of Joe vs. Punk 2. Uh, they do about 800 there. So... Um, I, I gotta say, I was pretty impressed. I, I think any time in 2014, they were able to bring in AJ or the Young Bucks. You know, this was like Bullet Club Prime. I remember being in Chikara's show that summer, and like half of the friggin' people in the club were wearing, were wearing Bullet Club shirts. E even some of the women were. I don't know if the women were watching New Japan or whatever the fuck, but uh, we're gonna get right down to it. Um, what the hell are they talking about here on Wikipedia? See, see, Wik the problem with Wikipedia and, and the DVD tapings is that they don't have the times and, and they're making a little bit of errors here. So the addiction in the kingdom was not a dark match. Uh, but yeah, this this was good stuff right here. You know, you got Christopher Daniels going at it uh, against the kingdom. Maria is out there. I thought this was a, a fun opener, you know, straight from the get go. You could just tell that the Milwaukee crowd was pretty good here. I, I always liked when the Ring of Honor used to run in this venue for Milwaukee. It was pretty pretty good. The lighting was a little bit dark, but it was actually a fun atmosphere. Adam Pierce actually goes over to Darius Thomas next. You know, Jimmy Jacobs and the decade, they wanted to teach, you know, their younger guys a lesson. Uh, so, yeah, Pierce Pierce had a really, really good weekend. You know, he lives in the Midwest. He lives in uh, Chicago. He trained with Punk. So that's why he's actually on these shows. So it was a good experience for him. That's still... After all these years, when when, when you watch Tedarius Thomas, uh, he's different, man. He he definitely is different. Uh, but I would say his his offense is definitely not for everybody, though. Uh, Tomasa Champa had a, a war with Jimmy Jacobs. Uh, I, I thought th this was definitely cool. You know, t t the fans were definitely into you know seeing Champa just pound the shit out of Jimmy. You know, they want to give uh, you know Tomaso some momentum. He's getting the title shot the next night uh, against Elgin. Uh, next up, we have AJ Styles taking on Kyle O'Reilly. Um, you know, definitely the match of the weekend. I mean, the, a great matchup right here. Um, sweet stuff. You know, AJ, you know, is just reinvigorated, you know, coming off of the, uh, you know, he's the IWGP champion. You know, he's having some of the best matches of his career. And, uh, you know, the, the O'Reilly match was good, man. It, it was it was definitely good. Um, not as much high flying, you know, from, from AJ in this match. This is a little bit more ground and pound. Uh, a lot of selling with O'Reilly working over the arm. Uh, just some really, really good counters from the, uh, you know, the, the triangle choke into the uh, Styles Clash. I mean, AJ was so good at countering that uh, that, that that submission from O'Reilly, the uh, the triangle choke. He actually he actually did a. Uh, like a pile driver, and then he transitioned to the Styles class. So you saw some really, really good, you know, just submission work into finishers. You know, it, it, this is when AJ started doing that, uh, almost like a butterfly suplex. It just looks sweet as hell. So uh, great stuff. You know, I, I would definitely say this is one of O'Reilly's best matches. And AJ as well. I would definitely say this is one of AJ Styles. Um, you know, hidden gems uh, in Ring of Honor. It, it, it's It's definitely on par with... You know, some of the best matches I think AJ's ever had uh, in Ring of Honor. This, this would definitely be a highlight for him in 2014. I mean, did AJ have a, a match better than this in 2014? I know we had a television match with Elgin that was really good. But for, from what I've seen, I, I, I got to say, this has got to be up there. All right, next up, you had ACH actually winning a six-man mayhem match featuring Lethal, Adam Page, BJ Whitmer, Bobby Fish, and Cedric Alexander. I thought this was a ton of fun. I, I thought it was really fun. Good action. The crowd loved it. Uh, ACH goes over, uh, you know, in, in both Mayhem matches or both Scramble matches for the whole weekend. Uh, so there you go with that. I think ACH, ACH is gearing up for a, a television title shot against Jay Lethal at the next pay-per-view, which is actually a uh, all-star extravaganza of, of five, I believe, or, or six, five, six, seven, eight, eight, one of those. I think it was six. Uh, next up, you got Hanson uh, taking on Roderick Strong. I, so this started to drag a little bit. I, I thought Roderick had a rough time, you know, getting up Hanson for some of the backbreakers and some of the power moves. But it was still solid stuff. Um, so Hanson actually defeats uh, Roderick Strong. I think some of the interference from the decade actually backfired there. Next up, you had the Briscoes. 
uh, taking on the Young Bucks. Great stuff here. Uh, you know, the Briscoes and the Bucks have, you know, wrestled a lot. Uh, you know, you remember the bigger shows more than this one. I mean, it's Death Before Dishonor. It is a big show. But, you know, Glory by Honor 8 was a huge show. They they wrestled there. Um, you know, Final Battle 2016. That's always going to be my favorite Briscoes Young Bucks match. I thought that was incredible. Uh, but yeah, this is another good one. This is another really good one. I mean, there, there's so many times that they wrestled. Uh, Briscoe's actually go over at the time. Mark Briscoe was, you know, almost trying to go legit. He was actually like rocking like a, a proper haircut, and uh, he was actually trying to. I think they were saying he was trying to go back to school or whatever. But it was pretty cool, man. I, I got to say, the Bucks were awesome this whole weekend. The, you know, at the they were still young, but you could tell they were more seasoned. You know, than they were, you know, in 2008, 2009, you know, whatever. I, I, I just think this was, you know, really, really good stuff. You had great kickouts. You had a, a great finish with the Doomsday Device. I really thought it was a lot of fun. And then the main event, you got Michael Elgin actually taking on Silas Young. So, you know, Silas Young and Elgin have had some, you know, wars in AAW, which is, you know, I, I believe it's in Illinois. Uh, I think it's in the Midwest around the Chicago area. I think they had like a 60-minute Ironman match. Um, so I could see why they went back to Elgin and Silas. But in front of a Ring of Honor f fan base, it's a little bit more mainstream than AAW. So, you know, it, 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 the magic quite wasn't there. Plus, they, they won against the grain here. And this was like the Jericho in Montreal thing, which I, you know, totally, you know, disagree with when, when Jericho's getting treated like a dot in front of Montreal, then he turns on the fans, um, you know, which is what Bischoff wanted Brett to do to the Canadians. And thank God Brett said, Eric, I'm, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but in this, you know, the fans are really in the silence because they're in his hometown of Milwaukee. So what he does is he totally goes against the grain and just starts burying the fans, just talking about how they're average and, just regular people and he starts just talking down to them and he he he, he turns the fans on him because elgin's a baby face see i just would have went straight board i said i would have went with elgin just being himself and then you just have silas sucking up to the milwaukee fans and you could have got a great atmosphere it was still a good match though it was still really really good you know silas hit his you know springboard offense was looked pretty good and you know there was actually a monster you know, belly to belly table bump that was, you know, really well executed. There was a little bit of teasing before the table bump, but, you know, what you got was actually pretty satisfying. So I got to say, Elgin, Elgin, pretty strong performance. But, you know, what what you take away from this weekend is, you know, why? Why, why did they take the belt off of Elgin? Was it something that happened in this main event? That just didn't click or, you know, he didn't get the main event the very next night. Maybe they just weren't happy with the way this unfolded. But I got to say, both Elga matches were pretty strong to me. There must have been something else that must have transpired, you know, to get them to, you know, officially take the belt off of Elgin. And then we get to the Chicago show. So I, I got to say, the Milwaukee show, it's probably more memorable because of the AJ O'Reilly match. But I, I think the Chicago show was actually really good, though. I mean, there, there's some great stuff here. All right, uh, first match tonight, you had the decade of Jimmy Jacobs and, and Roderick Strong actually taking on Ethan Page, who was going by Ethan Gabriel Owens. And believe it or not, Josh Alexander. At the time, they called themselves the Monster Mafia. So, yeah, I, I remember Josh used to be on a lot of, you know, Evolve shows and, you know, Ring of Honor shows like this where, you know, it kind of feels like a tryout or a dark match. So Josh really transformed his body since then. I mean, he, he was still a good wrestler, but he was a little bit soft. He was carrying a little bit more body fat. It's same thing with Ethan Page as well. But uh, it, it was a fun match, though, man. It was it was really good stuff. Um, I thought Josh looked really, really good. Um, but, you know, J Jacobs and Strong had some really, really nice double team work for the finish. The spear into the, you know, the sick kick into the spear from Jacobs uh, came off really, really well. J Jacobs was good here. He, he, he was cutting some of the best promos, I think, of his career here uh, as the decade. You know, he was really trying to toughen up, you know, to Darius Thomas and, and Adam Page, which we'll get to. All right, next up, we had Jay Lethal actually taking on Caprice Coleman for the television championship. And this got off to a weird start. I, 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 would, I wouldn't say Caprice was great here from a wrestling standpoint, but I thought you had interesting interactions. You actually had some, like, you know, jabbing and, you know, punching and, you know, sticking and moving from Caprice. But, you know, once Caprice started going into his routine of, uh, you know, rolling Northern Light suplexes, I was like, man, he look, he's looking pretty good here. Uh, but hey, you know, Caprice is, you know, kind of on the way out here, you know, 
kind of on the verge of uh, transitioning into a commentator. So he puts over Jay Lethal. It's funny, Lethal really had to work on his look back then. I, I don't think that ponytail uh, was a good look for him. But hey, he's still trying to build up the television championship into, you know, an important belt here. So it, I thought it was good, but not great. Uh, once again, you had ACH uh, in a four-corner scramble. As Christopher Daniels would say, a four-corner scramble. Matches don't th- don't matter whether I win or whether I lose. But this was good, though. I, you know, ACH, you know, back-to-back nights, wins the scramble match over Bennett, Whitmer, and Silas Young. Mar- Maria did a lot of stuff here. A lot of interaction with her on commentary and in the actual match as well. Um, all right, next up, we had Adam Cole uh, actually going over Hanson. So, yeah, Cole and Hanson met in the uh, Survival of the Fittest Finals. And, you know, I, I know it doesn't sound sexy on paper, but their chemistry is just really, really good. I mean, it, th- this is another really good match for them. I thought Cole just sold his ass off uh, to Hanson's power moves. And Cole just, he, he just came off like such an opportunistic prick heel, you know, going up against Hanson. So, uh, Cole goes over. He's actually burying Hanson's, uh, you know, teammate who actually got into a motorcycle accident. And so that leads to Tommaso Ciampa coming out to, you know, attack Cole uh, and the kingdom. And then we transition to Michael Elgin and Tommaso Ciampa, not the main event for the Ring of Honor World Championship. I thought it was good, though, man. I, I thought it was good stuff. Uh, Elgin was awesome here. I mean, the, the, the crowd wanted to see Ciampa get suplexed 16 times. For some reason, they wanted him to German suplex him 16 times. I think the most we've ever seen, uh, most I've ever seen is Chris Benoit doing 10 to Austin in the classic SmackDown match. But they wanted Elgin to do it 16 times. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought they wrestled hard. They Once again, you got those uh, those cross faces where they just keep scrambling and trying to lock the cross face on. Uh, you know, Elgin just, you know, annihilated Ciampa with, you know... You know, thighs right to the temple. So the referee had to stop the match. But, you know, Ciampa put up a good fight. But, you know, it, it, I've never been a huge Tommaso Ciampa fan. I've just always felt like something was missing from him. He's definitely had some classics, though. You know, the, the Johnny Gargano match from WrestleMania weekend is, is easily a five-star match. But I've never, you know, even the match with Gunther, I, I, I remember trying to watch it. I just couldn't get into it. Um, maybe I need to watch it again because I, that, that place really high. On a lot of the, um, you know, lists, you know, from this past year. But, you know, so Ciampa is a little bit bitter that he didn't win the belt and then he just snaps. He beats up uh, Bobby Cruz, the ring announcer. He tries to beat up Kevin Kelly and thank God Carino kind of stopped him from beating him up. But uh, kind of reminiscent of when Tommaso turned on Johnny Gargano in NXT. Just, you know, I, I, th- I think Tommaso, that, this is one of his gifts from what I've seen. Just, just the ability to snap and turn heel within a drop of a dime. So I, I really enjoyed that. All right, next up, we got Adam Hangman Page. Take, so Adam versus Adam, taking on Adam Pierce. So Pierce returns to uh, Chicago, his hometown, and he got used to, got a chance. He just annihilated the shit out of Hangman Page with some lariats here. So yeah, I got to say, Pierce was pretty good. The former Ring of Honor booker, you know, making a return. Um, you know, Page is actually able to get a jackknife pin to put away Pierce, but still Jacob said, just because you lost the match doesn't mean, you know, the war is over. And then they just humiliate and annihilate Adam Page. Tadarius Thomas is looking on like he wants to do something about it. But, you know, there you go with that. Next up, we had AJ Styles taking on Cedric Alexander. I gotta say really good stuff. Hell of an opportunity for Cedric. I'm not sure if these guys ever met in WWE, but um, really, really good stuff here. Very stiff, lots of great forearms from AJ. Uh, lots of great kicks from AJ. Um, you know, AJ took a lot of punishment, man. He, he he took a nasty looking backdrop. He almost got counted out for 10. But, uh, you know, he was able to, you know, get his revenge. And, um, God, that transition into the heel lock from AJ was was great. So lots of great selling from Cedric when, he had, uh, when AJ had the heel lock uh, applied on him. Eventually he had to tap out. But, yeah. Nice little war right here. You know, not, 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 not as memorable as the O'Reilly match. You know, people going to remember AJ and O'Reilly forever. But yeah, this Cedric uh, Alexander match, um, it, it doesn't look as sexy on paper, but it was still good, man. I, I, I would still say I, I, I think it really, really did, you know, almost hit the same level as, uh, as the O'Reilly match. It, it really did come close. So, so definitely don't sleep on it. Cedric is a hell of a performer. I, I know he didn't have the best look in the world in terms of physique and everything, but... You know, he could he could bust out some beautiful insecurities, some nice, really nice, strong power moves. So you you, you get the point. Cedric gave AJ, um, you know, a surprising little 
little war right here. All right, and then the then the main event we have an eight man. So this is actually a eight man elimination tag match. So if a tag team, if one guy from the tag team gets pinned, then the team is eliminated as a whole. And and thank God because when I'm watching this thing, I'm like, there's no way this could be a, an elimination singles match. Uh, so you actually have the Young Bucks teaming up with the Red Dragon. Uh, you know they met. You know, d during the New Japan show, they had the match of the year in 2014 for Ring of Honor. So they actually unite here and they're taking on the addiction of uh, Daniels and Kaz. So Daniels and Kaz are teaming up with the Briscoes. So in, in a way, it kind of feels like old school ROH versus new school ROH. And I, I got to say, I, I thought it was great. It, it definitely hit a home run. You had just a lot of, uh, you know, consecutive spots right here, you know, with the with the with, um, you know, the Young Bucks doing their you know, Meltzer drivers. Mark Briscoe does the uh, the forearm off the off the apron. There, there's a, there's some really really nice guardrail shots. You know, Kaz did some great stuff. So there's some beautiful just consecutive action where it's just one spot you know after another, and it, it was just really really cool. So you know, eventually you got the uh, the eliminations. I, I think O'Reilly actually got pinned by the best moonsault ever actually from from Daniels, and and then Bobby Fish starts you know bitching and moaning and you know looks like he's going to attack another guy and kevin kelly's like we got to have nigel come or if it's carino i said we got to have nigel and kind of um you know be an authority figure not to attack some of the officials so red dragons eliminated um the addiction actually does get eliminated with the uh more bang for the buck and then you got classic Bucks and Briscoes, the forgotten match. You know, I, I didn't know it just came down to them, and you know they really played off the match the night before. Uh, you know, there was there was a, there was a beautiful um, you know spot that uh, Mark Briscoe actually broke up. He actually did that flipping neck neck breaker on the ring apron to break up the more bang for the buck. Uh, the Bucks actually countered the uh, the Doomsday device, and you know Matt was able to kind of roll through it so he didn't get pinned. And ultimately, the Bucks, you know, get the revenge on the Briscoes. They hit the more bang for the buck. I got to say, you know, so, some some of the best finishing stretches I've, I think I've seen between the Bucks and the Briscoes uh, in this elimination match right here. So, yeah, the Bucks went on fire, man. They're wearing the, wearing the Bullet Club shirts. Uh, the fans are actually cheering them. They're not booing the shit out of them like they did in PWG or even in AEW. So, um, yeah, really, really nice performance. Uh, you know, a vintage, vintage weekend for the Bucks. In Ring of Honor, you know, you don't associate with the Bucks in, um, you know, Ring of Honor that often, you know, in most cases it's PWG and, you know, all elite wrestling. But uh, this is definitely a great weekend for the young Bucks as they go over the Briscoes. And, you know, I, I mean, I never really heard much about this match. I'm, I'm not crazy about the stipulation. It, it felt like too many tag teams in it, but uh, it was pretty damn entertaining, pretty damn good. I, I got to say, I, I was really impressed with Death Before Dishonor 12. Uh, from 2014. I, I wish I did not sleep on it. I slept on it for years, but finally got to see it. So uh, definitely check it out. Okay, we're moving on to Death Before Dishonor 13. This show took place on July 24th, 2015. Uh, this is coming off of Jay Lethal uh, triumphantly winning the title at Best in the World. This was actually a internet only pay-per-view from the ROH wrestling uh, site. So, uh, yeah, so it took place in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you know, it's funny. I actually did have this show, never reviewed it. And thank God I didn't review it because, uh, I, you know, I, I really wasn't feeling the undercard. I, I think I think the undercard was, you know, it was OK for what it was. And, and you would expect it. You would expect a watered down like undercard you know for you know considering the fact that they went 60 minutes with lethal and strong in the main event but i don't know man it just kind of just a couple of things really stood out here i i just think the 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 grittiness the rawness of everything during the roh heyday I, it just felt like it was missing you know especially for this show and, and it's funny like in some ways i think the production values they definitely got better, especially if you're trying to appeal to a mainstream audience. Like the lighting is better and, you know, you could definitely argue that the cameras are better. Like the, you don't see the overexposure and the lighting, you know, that, but, you know, the, there's something really, you know, raw and, and just, you know, good about the sound quality and, and just the rawness that the, the original ROH, uh, you know, heyday had. And I know some people hate when I talk about this because there are some people that actually love the Sinclair days. They love this Jay Lethal title reign, but I don't know. And the, the other thing is too, I just felt like, 
you know, I think because Gabe is from ECW and you know, he grew up under Paul Heyman, he, he just did a better job of just getting, you know, real life, you know, raw promos out of uh, certain guys. Like, I think he definitely could have helped out ACH with his match with, um, you know, Hangman Page. I, I, I don't know. I just, I just felt like something was just lacking throughout this whole show. There's just a lot of shit that I just did not really care, uh, you know, to get into. But um, let's just get to, down to the main event first. You got Jay Lethal actually taking on Roderick Strong. This was uh, this ended in a 60-minute time limit draw. So at this time, uh, Lethal is actually with Truth Martini. You know, Roderick Strong used to be managed by Truth Martini when, the, when he won the ROH World title. So you got a little bit of history here. You know, I really think, like, around this time, this was the time I would have gave Roderick a second reign. You know, because I, I felt like in 2015, 2016, especially when he started wrestling in Evolve, he really kind of, you know, it, it was, it, he really just started to go on a run. Like, he he just got, you know, in even better shape. The conditioning was a step up. And I just think uh, he was just becoming very well-rounded. I think the mic skills improved. You know, they probably aren't where they are now with the character being so redefined in AEW with the Adam stuff and everything. But, um but hey, man, lethal and strong. You know, it ends in a time limit draw. Um, you know, it came off pretty good though. After after the the bell rung, they they have that planet fan at ringside. That's at every ROH show at the time. You guys know who he is. I don't want to make fun of him, but you know, he kind of um, you know started a match of the year chant, and everybody joined in with him. So it, it came off pretty good. Nigel even said, you know, how many times do you get that chant in a time limit draw? Uh, you don't normally get it, but I, I think lethal and strong. Sixty minutes—it's it, quite a burden. I think strong going sixty minutes at at any phase in his career is is kind of a tough sell. But you know, it, it was a slow burn. You know, lethal really kind of dictated the tempo. What well, whenever strong had you know just you know outbursts of explosiveness. I mean, it was pretty damn good. I mean, he he really had his moments here. There was just some nice back and forth at the end with. You know, strong kicking out of the lethal injection, you know, lethal kicking out of the sick kick. You know, Roderick even put his body on the line to kind of, you know, take out Truth Martini and Donovan Dijak at the same time. So, uh, but yeah, lethal, you know, a lot of people think lethal was the greatest ROH champion ever. I think he actually, you know, topped the list from, I think it was what culture. Uh, I've always had kind of a great with that. And nothing, you know, the funny thing is, it's nothing against lethal. I actually love his title victory and. This is a pretty long reign. You know, you almost forget that he was champion. I think he was champion for over a year. It's like summer to summer. I think it's best in the world to the next death before he dishonored 2016 where he dropped it to Cole. So phenomenal title reign by Lethal. Uh, I, I, my, my problem with calling Lethal the, the best ROH champion ever, I, I just feel like the guys that made the company great, you know, should get that title. And it, at this time, too, it just felt like a lot of the guys that, you know, made the company what it was are just in... WWE or they're out there on the commentary booth like that's that's just my feelings about that but hey you know give lethal and strong credit you know it's it, I don't think it made my top 10 matches of the decade list um but you know Kevin Kelly and everybody was just putting this match over as like this was the greatest you know ring of honor title match in history I think they tried to you know try to give it a Joe versus Punk 2 feel with the 60 minute draw I, it, it just it just wasn't that, you know, especially looking back on it in retrospect. I, I just think Lethal probably had better matches during this reign, but it's a pretty damn good match. I, I just think the Lethal and Strong combination, it they're, they're, they were probably better suited to do, you know, shorter and more explosive matches. And they did. They actually had, you know, some really good matches. I think the um, they had a match in Philly at the Aftershock Tour that just was really red hot. I don't, I'm not going to say it's better than this, but, you know, um... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of like a forgotten classic, though. Like, you know, it's 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 still pretty damn good. It's still probably a top five, you know, Ring of Honor match of uh, 2015. It is by far the best thing on this show. I, I think it, it blows away everything on the show. It's a, it's a, it's a really really good main event. It, it's just funny they didn't really try to water down the undercard that much. I just felt like the undercard was just forgettable, though. I, I just think it was it was loaded but it was just it was just bland to me you know Silas Young and Will Ferrara I, I thought I thought that was a little bit forgettable Cedric and Moose you know you have Cedric cheating there to go over Moose you know Veda Scott's there Stokely Hathaway is there lots lots of manager interference it just it just didn't feel like it just didn't feel like um you know anything that competitive to me Briscoe's and uh 
Trent Trent Beretta and Rocky Romero. It, it was pretty damn good. I just I just felt like something was lacking in terms of uh, you know the build up here. But hey, the Briscoes Briscoes look great. Jay looked awesome here. You know he he it looked like a, a walk in the park for him to kind of you know reunite with Mark. You know after the uh, you know grueling Ring of Honor uh, World Title reign. Adam Cole and Dalton Castle. It was okay. It, it, it was a unique match. It's funny like Dalton's physique was was a lot more defined and. Um, you know, tone than Adam Cole right here. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a fun little match. You know, the boys are interfering, but I didn't really know what to make of it. I, I, I really didn't know. Um, you know, what the extreme purpose was, you know, for this exact match right here. But but I'll definitely say this about Cole. Like, it's funny. Everybody puts him over for being a pretty boy. You know, uh, uh, Carino even said that he has beautiful blue eyes and, you know, maybe that had something to do with, you know, Dr. Britt Baker and him, uh, you know, forming a relationship or whatever. But it's really, really funny, though. Like, Cole, like, his his physique and his, his aura, sometimes it comes off a little bit bland. And, you know, I, I still felt like Cole was was sort of in that bland phase right there. Uh, Adam Page, Adam Hangman Page taking on ACH, no disqualification match. This had a good buildup. This had a video package, but it, it just, they just didn't really do a great job of... Um, you know, explaining, you know, why both guys hated each other. I, I just felt like ACH, you know, had a little bit more in him that, that someone could have got out of him to kind of explain why, you know, both these guys hated each other. But, hey, you know, they went through hell in this match. This is Hangman just kind of, you know, leaving it all in the ring. Just a lot of, you know, crazy bumps here. He actually wins the match with the... Um, you know, the, 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 they had a different name for it back then, but, uh, you know, they called the red eye through the table. So uh, Hangman goes over ACH in a, a pretty fun match. I, I just I just felt like something was, you know, this was just really lacking in terms of, you know, the buildup, you know, compared to Hangman's match with Swerve. It's just night and day, you know. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really know if ACH really thrived in these um you know, matches that had these stipulations and, you know, we're supposed to have, you know, a heated buildup. All right, next up, we had the, uh, you know, the tag team titles in a four-way match. So, crazy stuff. I mean, they go about 20 minutes. It's, it's just a little bit too much for me, but it was good. You know, the addiction, taking on Red Dragon, the kingdom, and War Machine. Everybody here, you know, busted their ass. It was very chaotic. Lots of crazy bumps. Lots of, uh, you know, tremendous finishers left and right. It was really, really tough to make this thing work, but, you know, they got the job done. Christopher Daniels goes over with the celebrity. I think it was called the celebrity rehab. It was almost like a variation of Roderick's gut buster. So that's how the addiction actually retains the tag team titles here. You know, they're bitching about Cole being on commentary, leaking something out to the the commentary booth to end this thing. But, you know, everybody busted their ass. It was, it was a good performance from the tag division. I just felt like, yeah, I mean, I guess that's why they kind of did this. You know, you, you kind of just throw all the tag teams in there. And then once they're all out of the ring, the focus is solely on lethal and strong for a whole hour. I think that's the mindset about it. But, yeah, thank God I didn't review this show, um, you know, back in the day. I just don't think it would have went over that well. I don't even think this portion of the video went over that well. But, the, you know, you, you get the point, though. Lethal and Strong uh, was definitely match of the night. But you, you could definitely tell, like, when you look at shows like, um, you know, Joe versus Punk 2 or even World Title Classic, the, the undercard had, had a different type of, you know, you know, structure behind it. This this just felt like they didn't do a good enough job of, um, you know, it, it felt like they gave you a lot of talent. It, it gave you a lot of matches that got a lot of time, but it, 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 it just felt like they could have done a better job of just keeping things a little bit more, you know, tighter. So you get that big money match at the end of the show. And it, it's just, you know, one match show. That's pretty much all I can say about it. But Lethal and Strong, it really did hold up. I, I'm not going to say it was the most, you know, entertaining hour from start to finish. But it was it was pretty damn good. Okay, moving on to Death Before Dishonor 15. This was September 22nd, 2017. Cody is the champion. Cody takes on Minoru Suzuki in the main event. Um, this was actually from Las Vegas, Sam's Town. The, the Samstown Hotel, very familiar venue. They, they used to do anniversary shows, uh, you know, in this venue. And plus, I think Impact has had a lot of most of most of the Impact pay per views have happened uh, at this venue. Um, but yeah, that's Death Before Dishonor in 2017. <sighs> I, I, I would say it was it was it was mediocre. It, it was pretty average. It, it did not feel. 
uh, to me, like, hey, death before dishonor. It, it it just didn't. I mean, there was some good stuff on the show. Let's let's uh, let's touch on the main event first. So Cody is the world champion here. Uh, he beats Daniels at best in the world. So we're about three months into his reign here, and he's taking on Minoru Suzuki, everybody's favorite wrestler. You know what, man? I, I really wanted to see Suzuki and AJ Styles uh, from New Japan World, and I'm really good at like navigating like th these websites and finding matches or finding stars. And for some reason, I just could not find that G1 match between Suzuki and AJ. I, I just think it's a New Japan World issue. They just don't have it set up so you could access some of the older, um, you know, G1 Climax tournaments. So th th very disappointing if, if you're going to compare it to uh, a match like that between Cody and uh, Suzuki here. You know, obviously this was a nice feather under Cody's cap uh, to get a victory over Suzuki. But, you know, if, if you were craving that... Um, that intense, you know, warrior-like, you know, feeling that you would get from a normal, you know, Suzuki fight. Uh, you, you definitely didn't get it here. I mean, the, the match wasn't bad. It just kind of ended abruptly. I, I just felt like they didn't empty the tank. The booking here was just very, very weird. You know, Suzuki was going for his pile driver. Cody did a good job of fighting off of it. And then he just pretty much hits the... Um, you know, the crossroads out of nowhere. So it just felt a little bit unsatisfying. It wasn't bad, though. I, th I think Cody looked like he was in good shape here. But once again, like this match is really indicative of the way I think a lot of people felt about Cody becoming champion. Like, it just wasn't going to be anything must-see. It, it kind of still felt like Cody from WWE rather than the Cody of today. So I think that's what kind of hurt it more than anything. H how they booked Suzuki after this thing was kind of weird. You know, attacking the security guys. Uh, you know, it looked like he was going to attack carry silken but uh other than that man i i think the the main event it's it's disappointing more than anything i'm not going to say it's bad it's just it's just not satisfying uh you know for the minora suzuki fan base um okay so we open up the show with the briscoes uh, and bully ray actually defeating the kingdom the kingdom to actually move on uh for the number one contenders for the roh six-man tag team titles and then a couple matches later they actually lose to the elite. They lose to the Young Bucks and, and Hangman Page. So the Young Bucks actually do double duty here as well as the Briscoes. So Jay actually turns on Bully, which was cool. He actually just hits him with the with a piece of the announce table or one of the tables. And, uh, you know, Mark is a little bit confused. So the Briscoes turn heel and Jay just says to Mark, you know, that motherfucker is not one of us. He's not one of the Briscoes. That motherfucker ain't shit. So uh, the Briscoes move away from Bully Ray. I guess this sets up uh, the Briscoes to take on the ECW tandem of uh, Bubba and Tommy Dreamer at Final Battle. But, um, you know, Marty Skrull and, and Chucky e. T was was pretty damn good. I just felt like it was a little bit rust. I felt like it was a little bit short. I, I, think, I think if Chuck Taylor came to Ring of Honor in his prime and met this version of Marty Scroll. This is something that ROH could have really um you know done in the in the main event scene for the title. I think that the, you know these two guys could have been the cornerstones of of Ring of Honor had you know maybe Gabe Sapolsky stayed in and you know knew how to promote these guys. They had a really really good match. I think I just think Chucky was kind of you know not where he was uh during the Dragon Gate USA days or Jakara days with Fist. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people just really enjoy Marty's work. And, you know, this is just indicative of that. This was a match that, you know, just didn't feel that important. But by the time you get to the end of it, it was it was pretty damn good. Pun Punishment Martinez actually goes over Jay White in a Las Vegas street fight. They just made, you know, Punishment Martinez look really, really strong here. He got to do a lot of, you know, crazy stuff. Very reminiscent. You know, he, he really could be, you know, he really does kind of remind me of Undertaker, you know, with his size and just his mobility and the way he's able to kind of, you know, dive over the rope. It's very Undertaker-like. So, I don't know. I know a lot of guys aren't, like, very high on him. You know, he's the money in the bank holder right now. So, it should be interesting to see you know, what he does long term, but we'll see. Jay White, good coming out party for Jay White. He was able to get on the mic here and you could just see he's getting a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable, you know, at this particular time. Um, Kenny King actually uh, defeats Kushida for the for the television championship. This, this was pretty good, man. I, I got to say, um, you know, the interesting thing about this match was Kenny King was actually on The Bachelor. So they show clips of Kenny King on The Bachelor 
And then, you know, he's talking about how, you know, he still loves wrestling. So he wanted to come back to wrestling. So I guess they wanted to use some of that momentum that Kenny King got on The Bachelor. Uh, yeah, so he looked like he fit in pretty well. I didn't really think. I mean, he calls himself the pretty boy Pitbull for a reason. As Jay Briscoe would say, pretty boy pussy. But uh, I, I thought Kushida looked really good here. There was some good selling. But I'll, I'll tell you this. Like, Kenny King, I just think he struggles in long matches like this, there are just parts of the match where he just kind of loses me and loses the crowd. It just, he just does, he just has a rough time of, of, of keeping people engaged in longer matches. And I think that was the problem here, but Kushida looked good. I thought it was a, a solid match. I didn't think it was bad. I didn't think it was great, but you know, next up we have Silas Young taking on Jay Lethal. They got a lot of time. They got 21 minutes in the last man standing match. Very well built. Um, very, very well executed in terms of the storytelling and the, um, you know, the video package here. So this definitely delivered. Had, had some really vicious belt shots. A lot of those whelps, you could definitely see, you know, the lacerations on, uh, you know, Silas's back or Lethal's back here. Um, you know, the, the latter spot, I wasn't crazy back. They actually had the, um, what do you call it? The, the, the zip lock, the zip ties. God, thank God for those. I actually saved my toilet uh, a couple years ago. From getting a new toilet but hey you know the, the bottom line is they had a, they had each other um you know almost like handcuffed with the uh, with the zip ties on the ladder and then they both kind of fall off the ladder uh, and uh yeah i mean it was all right i just there was just something lacking about this environment for a lot of these hardcore spots to really work but yeah, it was it was a pretty convincing match you know um todd sinclair the referee you know, took a nasty bump and that kind of like, you know, killed Lethal's momentum. So you had that going on there. So yeah, this is an example of a heel go kind of going over clean in a last man standing match. I think there was some interference from the Beer City Bruiser. But yeah, Lethal really over delivered here, you know, to get this kind of match out of Silas Young. This was def this was definitely the second best match on the show. Uh, without a doubt. Next up, you had the, the Motor City Machine Guns winning the ROH Tag Team titles from the Young Bucks. <laughs> um, you know, pretty good stuff here, man. I thought this got off to a slow start. I think the atmosphere and the setting really kind of hurt this match. I just feel like these two teams have had, you know, better matches in better environments, whether it be Reseda or whether it be in, um, you know, e even the Supercard of Honor match a couple years earlier, I, th I think, just had a better environment. But but in terms of what they did in the ring here, it was pretty damn good. You had the addiction interfering. That kind of brought the match down a little bit. Well, once they got out of the picture, man, the crowd really got into it. There was just a lot of athleticism here, just a lot of, you know, good action, you know, with guys running the ropes hard. I mean, there was some beautiful avalanche uh, suplexes here that just came out of nowhere. So I would just say, yeah, really, really well executed. I, I, I think the thing about this match, it just kind of felt like Motor City and Young Bucks were pretty much on equal ground here. They were both a little bit more mature. You know, back during their DDT match, it just kind of felt like the Young Bucks were a little bit too green for the machine guns at that time. This was, it just kind of felt like they were more on equal footing here. But these two teams have had a ton of matches. I mean, they, they even had the Ultimate X match back in the day. So this is just another, you know, solid, you know, match from them. When I say it's their best match that they've ever had, in, in some ways it kind of felt like it was going to hit that level. So I'll, so definitely worth checking out. It was it was pretty awesome stuff. Definitely the, the match of the night. Um, and then the main event, you had Cody actually defeating uh, Minoru Suzuki again. You get to see Brandy coming out there. So Cody, he still had the dark hair here. He still looks very, very young here. Uh, he's doing that thing with the uh, the Ring of Honor ring. He actually he actually made Suzuki kiss the ring after the match was over. So that was pretty interesting. But yeah, um, bottom line is, guys, I, I just I just don't think this feels like a death before dishonor. And and so uh, what, who who was the dude? Was it Cody? Yeah, Cody was actually mocking uh, Daniel Bryan here. And uh, I think Rick Abani said, oh, Bryan Tennyson has a tremendous legacy at Death Before Dishonor. And, and I started thinking about it. I was like, he really doesn't. You know, he he turned on Joe during the CZW Cage of Death. That was probably the most interesting thing Danielson ever did. And, you know, Claudio turned on Danielson at Death Before Dishonor 6. I love that four-way, but, you know, Danielson got eliminated first. So, and I'm thinking about Death Before Dishonor 5. He had he had some pretty solid, you know, undercard matches with Mike Quackenbush and Matt Seidel. But but other than that, the, the and Danielson missed the first three, and then he missed the last one because of the staph infection. So, yeah, it's not true. Danielson does not have uh, a, a great legacy 
at, at Death Before Dishonor the way he does at, uh, you know, obviously Glory by Honor would probably be my pick. Uh, you know, Manhattan Mayhem or, um, you know, Final Battle, su- even Supercard of Honor. Uh, yeah, Danielson doesn't have a great legacy at Supercard of Honor either. You know, it's really just the first one. So I, I don't know. You know, Danielson, Danielson's legacy is probably at, at his best when you're talking about, uh, you know, Final Battle and, and Glory by Honor. So I, I never really thought of it like that. So, yeah. So that's that's Death Before Dishonor 2017. Yeah, 2017 just feels like a, a very weak year. Uh, for ROH, it's, just, it's no doubt about it. I mean, putting the title on Cody, you can't argue with it, with it in retrospect. But still, it just it just doesn't seem to me like it was really satisfying the fan base uh, at this particular time. Okay, we're moving on to Death Before Dishonor 16. This is actually from 2018. Um, so this is actually the follow up to All In. Like I think the first uh, you know pay per view, first big show after the. Uh, all in mega event, uh, which was at you know during Labor Day weekend. Uh, so going all the way back to September 28, 2018. This is actually from uh, Paradise, Nevada. Once again, the Las Vegas area. Um, and we started off with Kenny King, actually taking on Jushin. Uh, Thunder Liger. Uh, so huge victory for Kenny King right here. I, d- I didn't think the match was great. I-, I don't think Kenny King was the perfect guy to put against Liger, but I think at this time, Liger is kind of, you know, winding down. You know, this might have been, you know, this might have been one of his last U.S. appearances. I, I think the match was okay. I, I-, I didn't think it was great. Uh, you know, the crowd just wasn't there for you know, your typical Liger match. I mean, just, uh, you know, nowhere near the buzz and excitement from 2004, for example. Um, you know, Kenny King, a little bit disrespectful, um, you know, kind of shaking Liger's hand, you know, kind of, you know, playing possum and acting like a nice guy. Then all of a sudden he gives him a spine buster out of nowhere. So kind of kind of goes against the grain, kind of goes against the code of honor. And he's just saying, yeah, I learned from Austin Aries. I got a big victory over Liger, kind of acting like an asshole about it. So... Um, yeah, <laughs> not, not a great opener, but you know, if, um, if you want to argue that it's one of the biggest victories of Kenny King's career, uh, you can't really argue about that. So it's a big victory right there. Next up, we have the Briscoes, uh, taking on the addiction of Christopher Daniels and Frankie Kazarian for the ROH Tag Team Championships. Um, oh, this got off to a really slow start. I, I mean, just for a Briscoes match, I just felt like something was missing, but they kind of turned it around. Um, Frankie was actually selling a knee injury on the outside and it was pretty much like taken out of the match. I don't know how legit it was. You know, Daniel's not in great shape here, but his effort was good. He was really doing everything, the best moonsault ever, you know, really putting his body on the line. But, you know, Jay hit a Jay driller on the outside and the Briscoe's a little bit too much for him. But I got to say, as the match progressed, like the last five minutes were really good stuff. Good, good action from the Briscoe's. Uh, Daniels put up a hell of a fight. You know, you you have, you know, Mount Rushmore like Ring of Honor talent in this match. So, you know, not the worst thing in the world, but I just I just think it could have been um uh, just something was a little bit off about it. I don't know whether you want to attribute it to booking or, you know, the age of uh, Christopher Daniels or the injury of the Frankie Kazarian, but, you know, not as good as you would expect. But, you know, it, it, you know they got time and it, it was it, it had a pretty good, you know, finishing stretch. So next up, you had Sumi Sakai actually taking on Tennille uh, Dashwood. This is a, uh, you know, rematch of the tournament leading up to Supercard of Honor for the, uh, you know, the Women of Honor Championship. So, you know, once again, it definitely seemed like... Like Sumi Sakai, very similar to Hakura Shida, where they put a lot of trust and, and faith in her, giving her the championship and just hopes of, uh, you know, creating a new star. So I, I thought Sumi looked good here. I think the match got off to a rough start, uh, but the finishing stretch was really good. Tennille Dashwood, you know, pretty good effort here. Th- this was a much better match than the the Supercard of Honor match you know, from earlier on in the year, you know, the, uh, Tennille did a beautiful counter to, uh, you know, Sumi's Hurricanrana with the, with the power bomb. you know, that came off good. There was just some really good, um, you know, drama with some of the submissions at the end. So yeah, not a bad women's match, you know, pretty good. You could definitely argue this is the match of the night up to this point, but 
Uh, next up, we have Punishment Martinez actually taking on Chris Sabin. Uh, so, uh, Damian Priest at the time is the ROH Television Championship champion, and um, you know Shelley is contemplating retirement at this time. So this must have been during Shelley's uh, chronic back problems. Uh, Martinez actually, uh, you know, takes out Shelley and Sabin backstage. You know, just a lot of vicious beatdowns. Uh, good heel performance from Martinez here. You know, Saban was able to do a good job of, you know, using his athleticism and his high flying to kind of stay away from the power moves here. So it was pretty good. But, you know, Martinez gets a, a big victory over Saban, uh, you know, during the aftermath here. He's, he, he wants to just stomp Saban's head in with the chair. And then Jeff Cobb actually makes the save. The reaction for Jeff Cobb was huge. Uh, he does his, uh, you know, tsunami finisher on Martinez. And, uh, yeah, so that was a really, really cool moment to see, uh, you know, Jeff Cobb. Okay, next up we have Bully Ray teaming up with Silas Young to take on Flip Gordon and Cole Cabana. This ended up being a tables match. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what here. Uh, so Bully Ray's promo, um, you know, was pretty damn good. You know, he was he was really going at Cabana, talking about how he was and never was, you know, that, you know, didn't, you know, make it in WWE. He's actually showing off his Hall of Fame ring and he's very anti uh, Flip Gordon. I, I think, you know, back during All In, there was, uh, you know, Bully actually was taken out, uh, you know, through a couple of tables by Flip, you know, during, uh, you know, after Flip's match. So. All right, I wasn't really a big fan of this match. I I, I just think it dragged uh, big time. This is, you know, this is one of those tables matches where, you know, Bully, you know, kind of makes, you know, the referee takes a bump and he and he makes it makes it seem like it was him that actually went through the tables when the referee didn't see exactly who went to the tables. In, in, in a lot of ways, it's almost like a crime movie. A lot of times um, when you see, a, 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 you know, a crime movie, uh, they'll make it look like it was a suicide or both both guys killed each other, you know, just to make it look like, you know, he didn't kill him. Uh, you know, one of those situations. So, but hey, you know, Flip had some, you know, 450s through tables. Cabana actually looked pretty good here. It looked pretty athletic. You know, Bully and Silas were pretty much arguing through most of the match. But, you know, I just, I don't know. It, it, it felt a little bit cold to me. Um, you know, this is not something you really wanted to see, you know, in Ring of Honor. But, hey, I got to give Bully Ray credit. He got a lot of heat. He came off like an asshole during the video package. So uh, so there we go with that. Next up, we have the Bullet Club Elite. We got Cody, Marty Scroll, Adam Hangman Page, and the Young Bucks coming out there with Brandy uh, to take on Chaos of Okada, Chucky T, uh, Trent Beretta, Rocky Romero, and uh, Tamahiro Ishii. This is a 10-man tag team match. <sighs> it, it was pretty good, man. I, I mean, it, it felt like a lot. You had great star power here. It really left you wanting more. You know, once this thing got going, it was like, you know, just action all over the place. Just, you always had like, you know, one-on-one -on -one stuff going on in the ring at every single time. And uh, it, it was really, really well put together. You got to see some good interaction between Cody and Okada. Um, Nick Aldis was actually on commentary trying to hype up uh, the rematch for the NWA title, which is going to be two out of three falls at the NWA anniversary. So in, in a lot of ways, it, it felt like that kind of took away from this match. Though This match just felt like it could have been on TV. This is something that you could have done at, um, you know, a global wars or a war of the worlds, you know, type of thing. It just, this just didn't scream uh, death before dishonor worthy. And, and it kind of robbed the, you know, this card of its depth. I think coming up, coming off of all in, you know, they didn't really treat death before dishonor. Like it, it could have been, you know, a mega show. I mean, if, if they just kind of, you know, broke some of these guys up and had them wrestle in, you know, one-on-one -on -one matches and just gave this card a little bit more depth, um, yeah, I think this would have been an all-time great, you know, Ring of Honor pay-per-view. But, yeah, I mean, the, the the match was good. I mean, there's just really too much stuff to break over. The, you know, it didn't feel like the Young Bucks ever really got into a rhythm here. A lot of their great spots were definitely broken up. Um, Marty actually makes Rocky uh, tap out to the crossface chicken wing. That's the finish right there. But it was it was definitely fun. Ishii was in the ring a lot. You know, he did, he did some good stuff with... Um, you know, Hangman Page. You know, Page actually looked like he was coming into his own here. So lots of good talent here. It's a 10-man tag match. You know, 21 minutes for a 10-man tag. It's a little bit too short. What By the time this ended, like, it really felt like, like, I was like, man, if this gets like another 5 to 10 minutes, like, this could be friggin' insane. But it kind of ended, like, right before it got going. 
And then we're just going to move on to the main event. We got Jay Lethal uh, defending the ROH World title against Will Ospreay. A uh, great match. Uh, definitely the match of the night. Um, I think Lethal and Ospreay, um, you know, put, put together a pretty good match. It, it, it took a while to get going for me. I, I think it, it definitely had a feel of, you know, like where's the sense of urgency at first, it, and if it, it felt a little bit long, but uh, but I'll tell you what, I, I I think it was great. Lethal at the time was probably the better worker th- than Osprey, so it's it's a great performance from Osprey in terms of uh, you know maybe his first Ring of Honor main event. Uh, great building block for him in terms of just getting experienced. Um, obviously, I've said this before, nowhere near uh, the Osprey that we see today. He's really perfected that that Stormbreaker sequence. At this time, he was kind of, he had the sequence down, but it was more of a powerbomb. He, he he busted out the Oss Cutter, which was probably the highlight of the night uh, in terms of Osprey's offense. Um, there was one part in the match where, you know, Bobby Cruz took a super kick and then, uh, you know, Osprey intercepted the ROH title and contemplated hitting Lethal with it. So, and then Lethal saw it coming, and he's like, "Is that the is that the only way you can win? Is that the only way you can win? You know, prove that you can win like a man." So, you had some good dialogue here. Osprey did not, you know, use the title, even though he 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 thought about taking the easy way out. So it, that was a pretty good story. There's actually like this little like yellow ladder uh, that was used for the lighting, and um, you know they they tease some some crazy spots with it. Ultimately, Lethal actually took a power bomb or a sunset flip power bomb onto the ladder that was set up by the um the guardrail. So, you know, that was a pretty dangerous spot. But yeah, I think the ending was pretty sweet here, man. You know, Osprey's going for a you know springboard her Karana off the top rope. Lethal counters it into a power bomb and then he hits him with the lethal injection. So sweet finish. Um they shake hands, Code of Honor, Osprey kind of acts like, you know, you just just one more inch or one more second, and he would have, uh, you know, taken the title here. So, and then, you know, the aftermath, uh, Matt Taven actually comes out with the kingdom. And, uh, yeah, Taven is proclaiming that he's the real Ring of Honor champion. He throws down the ROH title and raises up his own ROH title, which is actually purple. Shades of uh, the Joker right there. So, yeah, I guess that sets up Lethal and Taven possibly for a final battle or whatever. I guess we'll have to see. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think this this was definitely a solid show. I, I think this undercard here, uh, it was a little bit dry. I, I wouldn't say it was bad. I, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of the tables match. You know, the, the, the tables match kind of had a crappy environment. But, you know, the, it's, it seemed like Bully and, and Cabana just had some great, you know, like real life dialogue between them where you got Bully really shitting on Cabana's uh, WWE tenure. So I like that about it. Um, but yeah, you get some great talent from Cody and the New Japan and the All In guys all in the same match. But it, it definitely felt like they were just kind of using ROH to promote themselves. It didn't feel or promote NWA or promote, you know, the elite or promote New Japan. It just didn't feel like it was, you know, the Bullet Club stuff just didn't feel like it was beneficial to ROH. That's how it kind of felt uh, when you're looking back at this show. But yeah, that's Death Before Dishonored 2018. And we'll move on to 2019. Okay, moving on to Death Before Dishonor 2019. So this is actually Death Before Dishonor 17. Yeah, the, these are these are tough to keep track of in terms of uh, the Roman numerals or the actual uh, you know numbers for Death Before Dishonor. But yeah, so we, to go back in time, uh, AEW is about to start. I think this week, so you you could definitely notice, and I noticed this with Bola too. Bola was around um, the same time as well. You, you could just feel like both companies suffering because of uh, you know the post elite. As, as a lot of people will call it, post uh, uh, Cody and the Young Bucks. Um, you could just definitely feel their presence missed. Um, so we're going all the way back to September 27, 2019. Once again, this is from Las Vegas, Sam's Town. Not a big fan of this venue. This felt, this almost felt like borderline pandemic uh, type of atmosphere. Um, the show was pretty good, though. I, I think this was around the time where, when Chase told me that uh, Marty Skrull was starting to get more involved with the booking. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, from a wrestling standpoint, it, it was pretty damn solid. Like, there's a lot of, like, really, really, you know, good, almost great matches uh, throughout this whole show. You know, on the, the dark match right here was really good. You actually had Jeff Cobb and Brody King. This is actually part of the uh, pay-per-view if you just watch it. And, uh, you know, this should have been on the show. It was definitely one of the better things of the night. Now, Cobb, you know, this is really Cobb. You know, I think he's coming off Ebola. 
He's taking on Brody King. It's a hell of a matchup in terms of uh, just size here. It's more of, more of a good matchup than a great match. I mean, it's a little bit lethargic. It's a little bit slow. But, you know, the feats of strength from both guys, especially Cobb, you know, were pretty damn awesome. Cobb actually wins with his tour of the islands. So the dark match, one of the better things on the show. Next up, you have, uh, there's a tournament to crown the number one contender for final battle. Uh, so you get Marty. Marty Skrull actually taking on Cabana uh, to open up the the main show. This is really good. This is going to go down as probably the best, you know, the last, like, almost great match Cabana ever had. I think Cabana was, you know, Marty kind of carried him to a pretty good match right here. It was, it, was, it was pretty long. I mean, they almost went about 15 minutes. And, you know, there was just some great, you know, kick out, some great setups into the crossface chicken wing. Cabana's moonsault actually came off good here. He was still pretty athletic at the time. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say Cabana looked in amazing shape, but, you know, I, I thought I thought Marty and Cabana really, you know, opened the show up with a bang. Uh, PCO actually goes over Kenny King, another tournament match right, right there. You know, that got a little bit hardcore. That was actually no disqualification uh, as well. Angelina Love actually wins the Women, Women of Honor Championship with the help of uh, Mandy Leone, the exotic goddess. Yeah, you know, the combination of Angel, Angelina and Mandy, kind of, kind of a weird combination. You, you would think these two would be... Uh, you know, jealous of each other, the total opposite. You know, one is a skinny blonde, the other one is a busty, exotic uh, brunette. But, you know, they were together at this time. Well, I don't know. I can't really say I, I was that impressed with Kelly Klein again. But Angelina goes over. All right, next up we have the match tonight. We got Jonathan Gresham taking on Jay Lethal. Gresham is going against the Code of Honor leading up to this match and in the match as well. Lethal's like, you got to use a chair. You had to use a chair. Is is that what you've come to? So you had a lot of good dialogue here. Um, I, I thought it was a little bit slow in the beginning, but by the ending here, you know, Gresham worked his magic. Him and Lethal have great chemistry in the ring. There was just some some awesome, um, you know, shots to Jay's arm, to Jay's knees. Uh, you know, the, Gresham's counter of the Lethal and Jackson was was pretty, pretty damn brutal. And then, you know, once again, Gresham locks him up in the octopus, which <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Jay, it looked like he was going to break Jay's arm uh, on the submission at the end right there. It looked painful. It looked hurtful. Uh, but yeah, Gresham and Lethal... Uh, I, I, I don't know if this is the best match they've had. I, in some ways, their final battle match, I just like the beginning of that match better than this match. But, you know, the finishing stretch here was awesome. You know, they've also had an Ironman match. I haven't seen that yet, but this is the match of the night. Another classic Gresham and Lethal match. This should probably make the, the top Death Before Dishonor matches of all time list. So if you get to check out one match from this show, definitely check it out. I, I love Gresham and Lethal. It was friggin' awesome. Uh, amazing stuff. Uh, all right, next up, you had the Barroom Brawl. Shades of uh, Vengeance 2003 right here. But, hey, you got the Beer City Bruiser and the the Brawler Malonis of the Bouncers taking on Vinny, Vinny Marseglia and uh, Silas Young. This is pretty wacky. <laughs> you know, if you like to see fat guys uh, get a little bit crazy and a little bit brutal, if you're a big fan of Balls Mahoney, uh, you'll love this match right here. But it, it was pretty fun, man. They, I mean... First time I've ever seen it, they're actually like throwing darts. You know, they're using the guy's bat as back as like a um, like a dartboard, and yeah, I, I think it was. Uh, oh man, I can't remember who it was, but yeah, you actually had the darts actually sticking into the guy's back. You know, shades of Vince Russo right here. He's like, bro, I rather I rather throw darts than watch Raw. So yeah, the match is pretty crazy. You got suplexes in the chairs. You have some crazy table bumps. You have fat guys really getting bloody. You know, the, the Beer City Bruiser and, you know, the bouncers are pretty much, you know, really, really fat dudes. But yeah, they, they brought it, man. You could definitely tell they have, they have fun with this match. It was a fun match, but at the same time, if you want to argue that was a little bit depressing, I'm not going to disagree with you. All right, next up we have Shane Taylor uh, taking on Flip Gordon, Tracy Williams, and uh, last second surprise of Dragon Lee. This is a four-corner survival match for the ROH TV Championship. You know, kind of, kind of disappointing. This really disappointed me. I, I said to myself, man, you have some good talent in here. Shane Taylor at the time, his contract is about to expire, so they thought that he was, you know, you would think he would have dropped the belt here, but he actually wins to get, you know, himself some leverage with the new contract. So that was the story there. Dragon Lee actually did some comedy stuff with the referee. That was actually pretty clever. But yeah, this never really got into the next gear, man. I mean, it just kind of ended before it got going. I, I think think you had great talent involved here. Flip is about to turn heel as well. 
and actually side with Bubba Ray Dudley or, or Bully Ray later in the night. So maybe that's why it didn't really, um, you know, overstay its welcome. But Shane goes over. And I'm not a huge uh, Shane Taylor fan. Yeah, he's, he carries a little bit too much body fat for, for you to really take him serious as, as a wrestler. But we're going to move on, man. We got the Briscoes uh, defending the tag team championships against Lifeblood. So Lifeblood is actually Bandito. And Mark Haskins. Uh, this was good, man. This is the second best match of the night. But once again, though, like something was just off with this atmosphere. I just I just feel like the Briscoes just weren't able to, you know, get this going into the next level. Just just a just a very you know, I don't know what it was. I, I just think maybe they went a little bit too late in the show. I, I just feel like, you know, the fans just never really got behind this lifeblood tag team. But it was still damn good. And just kind of makes you appreciate, man, how, how long the Briscoes have been in Ring of Honor and how, how long they really tore it up in ROH. I think if, if you took, you know, if you measured the history of Ring of Honor, the Briscoes might have been in the tag team champions or tag team title scene maybe 40 to 50 percent of that time so that that's pretty damn remarkable so at this time the briscoes are just you know it just felt like whenever they didn't know who the tag team champion should be you know you always put the tag team titles back on the briscoes it didn't really feel like the briscoes were heel or babyface here they, they just felt like you know a, a credible reliable tag team you just put the titles on them and then you know see if you could create you know some new stars so that's how it kind of came off here bandito was awesome haskins was was great i mean there were some good kickouts here but once again you know, there, there was some miscommunication with, you know, who was the legal man. And so that's what kind of cost uh, the lifeblood, the match right here. But yeah, pretty good action, though. They go about 20 minutes. They rock the house. But at the same time, if, if you want to argue that it was a little bit lacking, you know, I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, all right. Next up, we have the main event. We have Matt Taven uh, defending the ROH world title against Roosh. Really enjoyed the match. Um, so if this is Taven's best match during his ROH title reign, I guess this reign kind of sucked. Because I, I thought the match was really, really good. Just just a little bit unsatisfying. A little bit one-sided, too. The match was good because of Roos. I mean, Taven actually delivered some impressive suplexes. And, and, and it was almost like a gorilla press or a body slam. And, and, and Roos took a nasty bump onto the outside. That was pretty brutal. But for the most part, I just thought Roos... You know, definitely brought it here. Just his offense just looked violent, explosive. You know, I, I think, you know, so Roosh, you know, I, I think at the time, ROH was working very closely with CMLL. And, uh, you know, Roosh was definitely a diamond in the rough. So, you know, this Taven title, it seemed like this Taven title reign got a lot of negativity. And uh, just a lot of people didn't think he should be champion. So it, it's it, I, I would kind of agree, like, Roosh could really hold his own. You know, Roosh really, you know, blended in well with this Continental Classic tournament. You know, you threw him in there and, you know, he's, he definitely fit in with those guys. I mean, would you say the same thing about Taven? Would Taven have been able to fit in in that AEW Continental Classic? I, I just don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really think so. I think Taven's a hell of a talent. I, I just don't know if he's comfortable, you know, being a singles wrestler in the ROH title scene or a, or, or a singles competitor going for the title. I, I don't know if he's... You know, quite up to that level, but you know they had a they had a, a Matt Taven DVD to this set that came out around this time. I'm just saying to myself, man, if if, if Taven comes out with the DVD, man, maybe anybody could come out with the DVD. They actually had a Cody one as well, so they were promoting that at the time. But hey, you know, Roosh uh, wins the ROH World Title. This this is a match that really didn't overstay its welcome. It, it really didn't like go into overkill mode. Roosh just kind of, you know, did did his beautiful uh, you know sprinting knees. To Taven a couple of times and it just pretty much ended and Roosh gets a big celebration with his uh, family at the end of it so yeah Roosh would be ROH champion and going into the um, the very dark 2020 and uh, we'll just end it right there that's Death Before Dishonor 2019 really really solid show really really good stuff I, I, I thought I thought this was pretty damn good um, I, I just think what really hurt this show was just the atmosphere and um just a connection with the fans it was just there was just something definitely off there and this did a really bad buy rate as well 800 buys was the buy rate for this show so it just wasn't me i think a lot of people just weren't watching ring of honor and it's tough too when you have wwe and aew on television uh, i i just think you know you know roh nxt pwg uh, you know they were all going to take a hit within the next couple of years and you know that's exactly what happened but um yeah man that's step before dishonor 2019 
Okay, moving on to Death Before Dishonor 2021. So we're going all the way back to September 12th, 2021. This was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Not the original site. You know, a, a lot of a lot of the movement had to do with still. We're, we're still kind of in the, uh, you know, the, the we're still in the pandemic here. The vaccines had just come out. You got a lot of people wearing masks. I, I think that you're still with, with limited capacity here. So bottom line is, I think ROH made a um, return with the fans was actually at best in the world. That's where Bandito actually beat Roosh. Uh, I think they had done Glory by Honor. That was like a double night event. And now we have uh, Death Before Dishonor in September, right before the summer ends. So this is like right before Grand Slam. So, yeah, I, I mean, the general perception uh, with this show was ROH just seemed like it was really lacking within the, the star uh, power department. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it did feel like... You know, the, in 2020, the only thing I really covered was the pure title tournament. I think that was good. I think in, in a lot of ways, it um, it felt different. It, it felt like a throwback to the Murphy Rec days. It just felt like it was no nonsense. Like that was why I think a lot of people fell in love with Ring of Honor, and you, you didn't. It, it worked at the time because you know you didn't have any fans, so that was really the way to go. So in, in a lot of ways, ROH was really commended for how they handled the pandemic. Even like uh, going back to 2019, I think the general perception was that they were finally, you know, turning the tide. It really didn't feel like Sinclair anymore. I think they gave Marty, you know, a little bit more control and. It, it seemed like things were taking off, but um, but with this show right here, I, I just think it missed the mark here. I, I don't know what exactly the problem was. Uh, I, I just think, you know, overall, it, it just, I, I don't know, just, just something was just lacking throughout this whole thing. And then, um, you know, Final Battle ended up being the last show uh, under the Sinclair uh, umbrella. But, you know. To start it off, you had Alex Zane actually winning the Honor Rumble, uh, lastly eliminating PJ Black. I think also he eliminated, um, you know, Flip Gordon. But yeah, Alex Zane put on a good show in there. Yeah, I mean, the, the Honor Rumble wasn't bad. I, I just, you know, if, if you weren't really in tune with the storylines here, I, I just don't think it was that exciting to watch. I just felt like he got off to a bad start at the beginning. I wasn't feeling the Dalton Castle match. I, I really, you know, Eli Isom, I think he could see a little bit of potential with the athleticism and the size, but I don't know. I just couldn't get into the opener right there. I didn't like the finish. Then he had Taylor Rust uh, taking on Jake Atlas. Uh, you almost forget about the these two guys um I, I thought this had you know tons of potential in the beginning uh, i think rust really reminded me like of a younger tyler black uh but by the time he got to the ending here man i, I everything was just botched there was you know I, I think jake atlas either got concussed or you know he kicked out at the wrong time or he was supposed to kick out and he didn't it was just really really bad it almost it almost, um, you know, took the crowd out of the show. Uh, so from there, things really started to pick up here. I, I enjoyed this match. You had Homicide, Dickinson, and Tony Deppin actually representing Violence Unlimited. They're taking on the returning uh, John Walters, uh, the you know, one of the first pure champions ever. I believe the first after AJ left the company. So you got John Walters coming out, who Jay Lethal actually called a legend, which was good. Uh, you had LSG, who put on a good show. And then you had Lee Moriarty. This is uh, Lee Moriarty, supposed to be his last ROH show uh, before moving on to AEW. Um, I, I think this was really, really good. You know, th this, this kind of was like a throwback to the, you know, the Foley Steamboat stuff where it was, you know, pure wrestlers versus, you know, violent wrestlers. But it didn't really feel like that, though. <laughs> you know, Homicide really didn't, you know, do anything crazy here. You know, Dickinson was, was, was pe pretty much more of a, you know, no-nonsense technical wrestler. Tony Depp and a lot of people were high on him at the time. So this came off really, really well. You know, you, you actually had Walters actually apply a double mood a lot. Uh, the finish came off great. You know, you, you wish this could have got a little bit more time, but, you know, Homicide's kind of on the way out at that time. And, you know, what really stood out here is just the aftermath. Jay Lethal comes out, and it's almost like Lethal was almost like a president or a GM here, just really putting over the pure division, you know, just kind of name dropping everybody from AJ Styles to Samoa Joe to Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. It, it, I, I thought it was good. You know, the, the, the complaint was that it felt a little bit out of place. I think this is something you probably would like to do at the end of the show, not the middle of the show. But, uh, yeah, Lethal, you know, they could have used Lethal star power here. I mean, if, if Lethal wrestled on the show, he probably would have been the biggest star on the show, you know, besides the Briscoes. All right, so there, from there we get the Briscoes uh, taking on the original kingdom, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett. Maria wasn't with them. Maria was more involved with the women 
uh, this night, the women's championship. Um, but yeah, you know, not as good as their final battle match. If you remember our final battle 2021, the last, you know, our, what was supposed to be the last ROH show, um, Briscoe's and, and Taven and Bennett stole the show. You know, that, that, that might have been their best match. It was awesome. Uh, this wasn't quite as good as that. Th- this felt like they were kind of building to a rematch. You had no titles on the line here. Um, it's funny, man. Taven actually defeats Jay Briscoe, actually counters the Jay Driller into a small package. Um, just They just didn't empty the tank here. I think both teams looked really, really good. Mark did some incredible high spots here, but but still, you know, uh, you, you just can't expect what they gave us that final battle. And, and it's funny, you know, Jay was really upset about the finish. Uh, he, he was just a little bit somewhat frustrated, somewhat embarrassed uh, that he got beat by Taven. And it's funny, like you see like any time Taven's cutting promos now, even as a heel, he's wearing that Jay Briscoe. Uh, tribute shirt that where all the proceeds went to his family. So it just kind of reminded me, like if if I don't really buy wrestling shirts anymore, but if I was going to buy one shirt from AEW or whatever, it would be that Jay Briscoe shirt lot, for a lot of reasons. It, it would be cool to have, and uh, the money goes to the family. So it's not like I'm just throwing my money away to, you know, anybody. So uh, key, a good match right there. But yeah, not 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 you know, match of the night or what you would expect from these two teams. Uh, next up, we had Gresham. Jonathan Gresham defending the Pure Championship against Josh Woods. So, yeah, Gresham was an animal, a pit bull during the pandemic. I mean, he just he just really took it to the next level. I'm a huge Gresham fan. And, you know, that that's one of my biggest gripes with, uh, you know, the Tony Khan uh, era of ROH. I just feel like, you know, you, you couldn't have lost Gresham. Uh, I don't know what Gresham's really doing right now. It's just it just doesn't seem like he's that involved anymore with anything. But you know, I really thought Gresham really you know he would be the MVP of ROH during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, there's no doubt about it. So he's taking on Josh Woods right here. Um, you know, Woods is more of an MMA guy. He's still in ROH right now. He's you know he's in a stable. I think uh, promoted by Smart Mark Sterling that is, you know, really focusing on catering to athletes. But this was good. I mean, the good thing about this is they got time. Um, Josh Woods here. uh, I I, I can't. He's just another one of these guys that, you know, he's 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 got some good combat skill. But in terms of execution, in terms of athleticism, it's just a lot of it just didn't really translate here in, in terms of it being a good match. You know, the rope the rope break stuff was just a lot of grappling and, you know, both guys landing on the ropes to blow their rope breaks. Um, you know, the, the, the original finish here, there was like a there was like a rolling small package that went on like forever. And then they kind of double pinned each other. Then Gresham was just like, you got to start the match over. There's no way I, I'm going to have this blemish on my record in a draw. So he wanted to, you know, restart the match again. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it was okay. I just don't feel like Gresham ever really got this thing going into the next gear. I just think a lot of it just had to do with Josh's, you know, inexperience in terms of pro wrestling. Um, but yeah, I think Josh Woods, you know, ha- has a ton of potential. He's got the look. He looks like a badass. But, um, you know, in terms of striking, in terms of just, you know, really looking explosive, I, you know, this just didn't hit the mark for me. Um, the ending was pretty cool. You know, uh, he actually had a, a Gresham in a pile, pile driver position. And then he actually transitioned into a, you know, deadlift German suplex from a pile driver. It looked pretty cool. You know, that was the finish. So Gresham uh, loses the pure championship almost after a year. I think he actually won the pure title uh, a year earlier, um, you know, with no fans. So, yeah, this really opened the door for Gresham to go for the ROH world title against Bandito. Okay, and next up we had the ROH six-man championship match. You had, uh, you know, the the champions are actually Kenny King, Dragon Lee, and we had La Bestia actually replacing uh, Roosh here. Roosh actually had to get knee surgery. Um, So, yeah, Kenny King is uh, mixing it up with the, um, you know, Lucha guys, the Latino guys here. And he's taking on Shane Taylor promotions. So Kenny cut some really good promos on Shane Taylor, you know, calling him a pussy, kind of, you know, comparing him. They kind of comparing him to like Ben Simmons and, um, you know, kind of mocking the Philadelphia sports teams while insulting Shane Taylor. Uh, so he actually takes out Shane Taylor with the chair, you know, before the match even starts. So Shane Taylor actually gets replaced. So it's actually Jasper Khan, Moses Maddox and O'Shea Edwards here. Yeah. One of the dudes from the Mogul Embassy is actually in this match as well. So, um, yeah. 
yeah, Shane Taylor Promotions actually wins here. Yeah, you, you definitely have some, um, you know, potential here with Shane Taylor, you know, running his own, you know, stable. I, I think Kenny definitely had a, a little bit of juice here, uh, you know, at the end of this ROH run. But yeah, you know, there was a lot to like in terms of, uh, you know, the storyline here. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely say that. I, th I think the match is pretty good, but not great. Uh, next up, we had the women's championship. We had Maria uh, at ringside that was going to, um, you know, crown the first ever ROH women's world champion. Uh, so you actually have Roxy defeating uh, Miranda Alizé. Um, what was probably the match of the night. I I'm going to say this is the match of the night. I think Roxanne Perez here, uh, this is before she got to NXT. You could just tell. Um you know, she's definitely gotten better. Like, if, if I were to say, did she look better here or did she look better at Stand and Deliver um, this past WrestleMania weekend? You know, she definitely got better since then. But I, I think more than anything, like, she's got star power. She's got great looks. I mean, very similar to AJ Lee. She definitely has, like, that type of, you know, look. Um, very exotic, very pretty, very cute, but at the same time, very athletic. And uh, she, and she was able to take a pounding here from Alizé. Alizé really kind of controlled the match, very violent. Uh, the finishing stretch was beautiful. There were some really, really nice extensions with the super kicks. Roxy actually does her, you know, finish, which is almost like a, you know, a standing sunset flip, which is really, really good. So Roxy uh, wins the women's championship here. I think she actually takes on Willow at final battle, which would end up being the last women's uh, title match under the St. Clair umbrella. And then the the main event, the main event wasn't good. I, I didn't I didn't enjoy this thing. I think it had potential. This was an ROH World Title match, uh, four corner elimination match. So Shades of Death before Dishonor six there. I love that elimination match, but this obviously nowhere near as good, nowhere near as talented. We got Bandito taking on Brody King. Um, Flamita and uh, EC3 from uh, from from t from Impact. Uh, remember, EC3 made a big name for himself. He he was pretty good here in, in terms of the video package, but you know, in the ring here, you know, he just looked like he was breaking down. It, it to me, it just looked like a steroid body that was just you know em you know the gas was just kind of on empty here. You know, just not a lot of life. Um, just, just very, very lethargic, just really kind of brought the match down. So he was actually the first one eliminated. He actually got disqualified. Um, I I'll tell you what, Bandito looked great here. You know, when he was in the ring with Flamita by himself, with just those two guys, it, you know, Bandito was really able to, you know, showcase his offense. You know, it just looked good. It, it looked really fast paced. It looked awesome. So uh, Flamita gets eliminated by Brody King. I think Brody does the Gonzo Bomb to take him out. So the ending between Bandito and Brody, it, it was pretty good. I mean, I'm not a huge Brody King guy. I, I think he's okay. You know, he, he's just a little bit too big and a little bit too clunky, you know, for me. I, I know Punk was a huge fan of him. Probably more had to do with the tattoos. And it'd be interesting to see, like, I know Punk knew who Brody King was, but it'd be interesting to see how far Punk actually went to actually watch some of this ROH stuff. Do you think Punk actually ordered this show? I, I would seriously doubt it, but you never know. Um, you know, Bandito actually goes over Brody King, actually counters the Gonzo Bomb into an Oklahoma roll. Eh. It was it was an okay uh, match right there, but at this time it just felt like, you know, I just I just you know the 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 feeling that I got from this show was, it, it just it felt like the company was on life support, like it it really really did. I I, th I think in a lot of ways I would prefer there to be like no fans, than to have you know this type of atmosphere for an ROH show. Um, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. I, I I still think, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, Tony has, Tony Khan, he had access to a little bit more talent. I just think, you know, he just knows how to put on, you know, better shows than this. Uh, the, the show was good, but it was just, it just wasn't great. You know, at, at this particular time, if this was ROH's biggest show of the year, you know, it, it needed to be, you know, better than this. I would definitely agree with that. I mean, it, it depends on, you know, what, what you totally want. In, in a lot of ways, I, I really... You know, kind of wish ROH was its own competitor, that they could compete with everybody under their own umbrella without feeling like NXT, you know, without being underneath AEW. But the side effect is, I, just, I don't know, you're only going to get three monster ROH shows every year, and they're really, really freaking good. They're, they're a lot better than this. So it's almost like, what would you take if you had if you had your pick? Um I just don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure. I mean, I, I just wish, 
you know, you could definitely see a little bit potential potential here with where the company was going. But at the same time, ugh, I, I got to say, man, I got to say this this show just kind of missed the mark for me. And, you know, ultimately, you can't say that this show is a success because the very next show that, you know, the, the company was basically on the way out, you know. And um, yeah. And then we had our final battle where, you know, it was supposed to be the last show for a long ass time. And, you know, Tony Khan was able to take over the company. So, um yeah you know maybe maybe when you look back on it maybe you could just say you know maybe if it wasn't for the pandemic you know roh would have really you know started to take off because it, it did finally feel like you know they were really you know finding it with that pure title tournament um but yeah i'll just end it right there that's that's before dishonor 2021 okay moving on to Death Before Dishonored 2023. This was actually from uh, Trenton, New Jersey. They, they did almost 3,000 in attendance. Um, you know, so so finally getting the chance to evaluate the show from uh, from last summer. Pretty good, man. Pretty pretty much better than expected. I I, I think at the time. Um, a lot of people passed on the show, and in, in, in a lot of ways, this was kind of the end of, uh, you know, buying Ring of Honor pay-per-views through, uh, you know, Bleacher Report. I, I, you know, I would imagine, I didn't look up the buy rate, but, you know, I would imagine that because of the uh, low level of interest for this show, you know, this, this is what's going to start the, you know, Honor Club exclusive uh, pay-per-views. But it's a shame because it was, it was a really, really good show. I, I definitely wanted to see it at the time. Uh, if you remember in July, you know, you're coming off of Forbidden Door, you're coming off of, uh, you know, Money in the Bank. I mean, you, you name it, all these different, uh, you know, Slammiversary, all, all these different shows, you know, at that particular time. So I, I, I think that's why a lot of people probably, you know, passed on the show. But it was really good, though. You know, Gravity and Commander, you know, they open up the show with the bank. Commander was great here. Gravity kind of steals the victory to set up his match against Pac uh, on Dynamite. I don't remember the Pac and Gravity match, but... It was cool because they always call, you know, Pac the man that Gravity forgot. So the fact that he's actually going up against Gravity on Dynamite was pretty cool. Um, you know, I mean, the fans were really into that. I mean, it was just, just you know, an ideal, you know, opener right there. You know, didn't overstay its welcome, but it was a ton of fun. Um, next up, we have the ROH Television Championship. You got Samoa Joe uh, going over uh, Dalton Castle. It, it, it was pretty good. I, I mean, th this was cool because it's like ROH has passed. Versus ROH's, you know, future in, in some ways. They're actually two former Ring of Honor World Champions. Totally different. They were champions at totally different times. So it was cool to see them. But I, I will say this about the match. Um, it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. It, it, it had its moments, but it, it was it was a little bit long. Uh, it, it's just ironic that Joe was able to... When, when you go back to this match right here... I, I just don't know if anyone would have predicted that Joe would have been, you know, AEW champion at the end of the year. How do you go from ROH television champion to AEW champion? Uh, it, it, it was an incredible leap. Uh, and, and I, I, I got to say, I think Joe's actually gotten a lot, not a lot better, but I, I just think he's kind of, you know, taking, taking it up a notch, you know, since that point. I, I'm not a huge Dalton Castle fan. Um, I, you, you could definitely see some of the decline here compared to, you know, when he was the champion. I, I'll definitely say that. But uh, next up we had, you know, m m maybe the surprise of the night. You had Aussie Open, uh, Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis actually winning the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships uh, from the Lucha Brothers. Uh, you know, the Kingdom is actually in this match. Uh, Maria was out there. You know, she played a role really nicely. You had best friends. Uh, you know, they got about 17 minutes out there, but it was a ton of fun, man. I mean, th this, this this was great stuff. I mean, it, it really was. You know, they worked in a little bit of comedy. They worked in some, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, finishers and, and high spots and creativity. Um, you know, sometimes these four-way tags, you know, feel like a mess. But this was just really well thought out, really well executed. Um, and Aussie Open actually wins with the, uh, you know, as they hit their finisher on uh, Trent Beretta. Uh, you know, so them as Ring of Honor World Champions, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of just used them uh, for the MJF Adam Cole storyline, looking back on it. But, you know, this this was this was definitely one of the, the better things of the night. Next up, we have the worst match of the night, in my opinion. You got the uh, the mobile embassy actually taking on Leon Ruffin, who I believe is actually Cheeseburger. And 
You also have Master Wado and uh, Raisuke uh, Taguchi, better known as Six or Nine. Um, so it, Master Wado actually won the best of the Super Juniors tournament. So, it, it, you know, he, he, he was coming off of that big victory there. But th this just didn't hit for me. It just didn't hit. You know, the Moga Embassy pretty much dominated this. You know, Leon Ruffin, you know, took a pounding out there. Uh, you know, Master Wado and, and the, you know, the guys from New Japan, you know, tried to show what they can do. But, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of... I was just kind of there, you know, but overall, the Mogul Embassy gets a, a dominant win as they retain the six-man tag team championships. All right, next up, we have Shibata actually going over Danny Garcia. Um, this is a, you know, for the Ring of Honor pure title. You got Daniels, Jacobs, and Jerry Lynn out there as judges, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, the, you know, Shibata was able to win right before the 15-minute time limit. Not a lot of rope breaks here, uh, but, you know, they suplexed each other hard. There were times where Shibata felt disrespected by Garcia doing the dancing or, or, or doing certain types of, you know, generic submissions that, you know, apparently the Boston Crab is considered to be disrespectful to do to a legend. Um, you know, I, I didn't know that, but I, I guess it does make sense. Shibata actually ends this thing with a, you know, wicked kick to Garcia right before the uh, time limit expired. Um, yeah, solid stuff. You know, the, I, th I thought some of the suplexes were hard. You know, th this actually did receive, you know, some This Is Awesome chants. So, um, so there we go. Next up, we had the Dark Order uh, taking on the Righteous. Uh, the Righteous actually teaming up with Stu Grayson. So, I, you know what? When I watch this back, the Fire Without Honor, this really... You know, this in some ways, this really stole the show or was the surprise of the night for most people. Uh, I, I think in retrospect, they could have done a better job with the, uh, you know, video package here. They did. They did show a promo from the righteous, which was good. Uh, but I think they could have went more in depth about the Stu Grayson splitting from the Dark Order. So the Dark Order gets his, uh, you know, they get their revenge on Stu Grayson. And it was pretty crazy. You know, Fight Without Honor, they brought out the uh, barbed wire. They brought out Legos. They brought out, I, I think, tax. There was a, a tremendous ladder bump. Um, but overall, man, it, it, was, it was definitely a lot of fun. You know, the, the Legos was really interesting. Um, you know, maybe, you know, I, I think we've definitely seen them before, maybe in DDT and, you know, some of the promotions from Japan. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty damn good. I mean, I, I think I think going into this thing, the expectations were kind of low, considering these guys don't really get on television that much, at least in AEW. But, you know, they were able to have a nice little playground uh, in this particular you know, show and, and it really it really did deliver. So so definitely check it out. Uh, I, I believe Stu Grayson actually does get pinned there because, you know, you, you got to keep in mind, Stu Grayson had a you know tremendous history with the super smash brothers and evil uno and you know and this is kind of uh you know him going against the grain and actually getting defeated uh by the dark order here so next up we had claudio taking on Pac uh for the ring of honor world championship i i, th I thought it was great man Pac really came to play uh, this is actually his first Ring of Honor match, I believe, since Manhattan Mayhem, too. So it's, it's been quite some time. But he did wrestle Claudio at Bola. Um, you know, I, 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 he's just such such an awesome wrestler, man. They made for such a great combination. Like I said, that, that gorilla press on the table kind of came out of nowhere. That was sick. You know, the Ricola bomb off the top rope and said her, uh, her Karana was crazy. Uh, you know, he, he, Pac even countered the... Um, the torture rack in, into the uh, into the brutalizer submission, which you know definitely another highlight of the night. The, the ending was kind of crappy. Wheeler Yuta comes out of nowhere, distracts Pac, and they kind of build you know to a trios match on Dynamite, which you know kind of sucked. I, I, I think that's one of the the problems with this pay per view. It felt like they were you know promoting and building to you know Dynamite matches, you know, which I you know it, it, you understand it, but it's just kind of annoying. Uh, but yeah, Claudio goes over Pac, and you know, the, to me, this is the match of the night. It felt competitive, you know. It had like a European, you know, international flavor to it. So uh, I really enjoyed it. Next up, we had Athena actually taking on Willow uh, for the Ring of Honor Women's Championship. Yeah, I mean, this was great. You know, the, at the time, you know, Athena really, you know, gave us, you know, possibly the best women's wrestling match in Ring of Honor history. You know, the women had never 
you know, gotten the main event. You know, if, if you go back to Ring of Honor's heyday, the, the weakest thing about the shows was that they would never give women time. They would just kind of be, you know, buffer matches uh, coming back from intermission or, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, e even Sarah Del Rey never really got the green light uh, to deliver in Ring of Honor like Athena's getting right now. So uh, a nice little turnaround here. I was really disappointed in Athena's match at Supercard of Honor. I just I just didn't think it brought anything to the show. Um, I think she wrestled one of the girls from stardom. Uh, but yeah, her and Willow had a, a nice little storyline here. This, this, it was a great heel performance. Willow was a monster baby face. Uh, you know, her parents were at ringside. The fans definitely got into it. I was a little bit, you know, when I heard this was the main event, I was like, wow. Like, how are they going to follow everything? But uh, it turned out quite well. And, uh, you know, Athena is just, she's just been a great heel. I mean, she was able to get Willow off of her feet. You know, she was able to do some really, really awesome cutters into some, you know, pretty, you know, convincing submissions. So a, a good performance from both women, man. Uh, it's funny, man. A Athena's main event from Final Battle against Billy Starks was even better than this. So um, I think that's the one silver lining about, you know, this Ring of Honor with Tony Khan, uh, you know, owning the product. It, it does feel like giving Athena this main event spotlight is something that's different. It's never really been done before in Ring of Honor, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, th this was an awesome show. I, I know a lot of people didn't give a fuck about this show, but I thought it was great. You know, I, I think you could definitely argue that it was a little bit more consistent and a little bit more tighter than um, both Supercard of Honor and Final Battle. So I'll end it right there. That's Death Before Dishonor 2023.